And we have managed to solve that before the crisis and a part of it during the crisis, and we'll continue uh, on that path. Uh, uh, and this part of the problem, in my mind, is more or less uh, uh, resolved uh, through what we have already done as a government. The second big problem uh, uh, was and is the uh, uh, difficulties for investors to actually make the investment possible in terms of uh, how the uh, uh, the various uh, uh, public uh, entities and services uh, operated. Uh, that covered a lot of things from getting permits to uh, uh, how the uh, how fast the uh, the ability to buy uh, 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 land or or a building. Uh, lots of different different things which had to do with how the state operates this this we have already started to to solve and in the greek recovery uh, plan uh, greece 2.0 we are introducing a huge number of uh, uh, reforms uh, we introduced 58 uh, if I remember well, different reforms. Most of them are uh, going to change the, the way that the Greek state operates towards investors. Uh, these reforms, the advantage of getting into the, uh, the uh, uh, Greek recovery uh, and resilience fan, uh, and, and, and plan is that uh, they are accompanied by specific milestones and targets and uh, both us and any government that will come will have to honor these uh, uh, milestones and targets uh, in the for the foreseeable future so uh, uh, these reforms will totally change the, the, the business friendly attitude of the greek state plus big part of our uh, plan goes into digitizing the state, giving priority to these services from how fast the justice system will operate to uh, 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 the interoperability of the state permit mechanism so that you don't have to, to, to carry uh, uh, information from one part of the state to the other as an investor, etc. So this we will be able to change very fast in the next uh, two to three years. There will be a totally different uh, attitude towards uh, uh, investors. Uh, so this is something that will also change. The third main reason that we could not have uh, 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 investment as much as we should was and still is the difference in uh, interest rates between uh, uh, Greece and the rest of Eurozone countries. On average, the Greek firms had to pay and have to pay 190 basis points for investments uh, uh, above what the European average, the other uh, competitors in, in Eurozone paid. So this, uh, especially for the smaller and medium businesses, uh, where the gap was e even bigger, was a big handicap for uh, investment. Now, uh, what we're going to do uh, with the RRF loans is for the eligible uh, investments, which means investments in green transformation, in digital transformation, extrovert investments, is investments in R&D and innovation, plus investments uh, 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 for, uh, made by firms that are cooperating or consolidating, firms that are scaling up, 
all these investments will be funded with uh, the RRF loans, which will drop the average interest rate for these investments, uh, will cut the average interest rate for, for these investments about in half, uh, uh, which is going to be a huge advantage uh, for uh, for Greece in the next years, uh, because it will stop, uh, it will level the playing field with the other European Eurozone countries in terms of these kinds of investments. Uh, of course, this is based on the fact that uh, uh, the firms themselves will put uh, money as own capital, at least 20%, and then a third party mostly a bank or a European banking institution, uh, will also put at least 30 to 40 percent of the investment in uh, uh, commercial terms. And we will add there uh, our own share coming from the RRF loans, uh, which is going to be on average about 40 percent of these investments, uh, but with uh, an almost zero interest rate. and. Uh, of course, all that uh, uh, under the uh, uh, EU regulations on state aid, which are going to be absolutely uh, enforced in this case. So, essentially, our plan aims to solve all the three main uh, uh, problems of the investment gap, and we intend to mobilize adding both public and private investment through the uh, uh, Greek National uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan, the Greece 2.0, uh, about 57 billion euros of investment. Thus, we hope we will be able to cover a big part of the investment gap. We will add 7% as the, the, uh, the analysis of Bank of Greece shows uh, a permanent increase of, uh, the, of our GDP uh, coming both from uh, 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 investments and reforms and the private investment uh, that we're going to mobilize. And uh, uh, because about uh, uh, two-thirds of the investment in these 57 billion will be private. And this will change the trajectory of the Greek uh, debt uh, sustainability. So this is the plan that we have, and we are very confident that we are going to achieve much better results in the years to come uh, than what has been achieved in the past 10 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, that was excellent to hear that, obviously, following on from Mr. Strauch's final um, comments about um, the growth uh, challenge. It was really good to hear that detail um, about how the government intends to close the investment gap, which obviously has been um, a big problem for Greece over the past decade, as you outline. So let me ask now um, Mr. Dimitris Psychonas, the Director General of the Public Debt Management Agency, to give his perspective on this question. Welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for having me in this panel with uh, such an excellent uh, participant. Uh, a couple of them, I know them for the vast past. Uh, so. And uh, I also thank you in advance that uh, you're going to provide me the opportunity to speak or to have my intervention in Greek as a gift to the domestic audience, uh, celebrating the 200 years of our independence uh, day. Thank you very much. Let me start with my intervention. So, you know, first of all, I need to make a correction uh, before starting my intervention. Uh, the outcome, the final outcome, as far as the debt to GDP ratio for this for the previous year would be close to. 205% uh, instead of 209. Now, let me start. 
Η Ελλάδα γιορτάζει φέτος τα 200 χρόνια από την ανεξαρτησία της. Είναι ενδιαφέρον αλλά και χρήσιμο να υπενθυμίσουμε ότι η χώρα μας αναγνωρίζει ως δότητα, όπως είπαν και στο προηγούμενο πάνελ του προελίσσαντες, το 1824 πρώτα ως δανειζόμενος, λόγω των δανείων που συνήψε για τον ευελευθερωτικό της αγώνα, ενώ μερικά χρόνια αργότερα, το 1830, με το πρωτόκολλο του Λονδίνου, αναγνωρίστηκε και επίσημα ως κρατική οντότητα. Κατά μία έννοια, το δημόσιο χρέος αποτελεί ένα από τα συστατικά της στοιχεία. Το 2009, η ελληνική δημοκρατία ως κρατικός εκδότης ήλθε αντιμέτωπη με την κρίση χρέους και στη συνέχεια με την τεράστια πρόκληση της αποκατάστασης της φήμης και του αξιού χρεώτης στις διεθνείς κεφαλαγορές. Πρόσφατα η χώρα, με τη νέα έκδοση ομολόγου διάρκεια 30 ετών, έκανε ένα μεγάλο βήμα προς τα εμπρό. Η πρώτη φορά μετά από περίπου 13 χρόνια επιστρέφοντας σε σημαντικό βαθμό στην κανονικότητα ενός κρατικού εκδότη της Ευρωζώνης. Ήταν μια εξαιρετικά επιτυχημένη έκδοση που χαρακτηρίστηκε από έντονη ζήτηση υψηλής ποιότητας επενδυτών, μεγάλης γεωγραφικής διασποράς με σύνολο πραγματικών προσφορών που υπερκάλυψαν πολλές φορές το ποσό της έκδοσης των 2,5 δις ευρώ και τη οποία η συμπεριφορά στη δευτερογενή αγορά μετά την ημερομηνία διακανονισμού ήταν και παραμένει εξαιρετική με αυξημένη ζήτηση, μείωση των περιθωρίων spreads και σημαντικά αυξημένου ημερήσιου όγκου. Αξίζει να, θυμι... να θυμηθούμε επίση ότι τον Απρίλιο του 2020, στην αρχή του ξεσπάσματο τη πανδημία, η οποία δημιούργησε μεγάλη αναστάτωση στι αγορέ, κατέστη εφικτό για το ελληνικό δημόσιο να εκδώσει ένα επταετέ ομόλογο ύψου 2 δισεκατομμύριων ευρώ. Ήταν ένα γεγονό από το οποίο αντλήθηκε θάρρο για την ικανότητά μα να έχουμε πρόσβαση στι αγορέ κάτω από εξαιρετικά αντίξωε συνθήκε. Κατά μία έννοια, το ταξίδι για τα 30 χρόνια ξεκίνησε τότε, αφού η έκδοση του επταετού ήταν ένα σαφέ μήνυμα για εμά. Η ελληνική δημοκρατία τελικά αξίζει να θεωρείται ω ένα κανονικό εκδότη, κρατικό εκδότη τη Ευρωζώνη, παρά την προσπάθεια που θα πρέπει ακόμα να καταβληθεί έω την πλήρη ανάκτηση τη ιδιότητα αυτή. Από εκεί και μετά έπρεπε να προχωρήσουμε προσεκτικά, παραμένοντα συνεπεί στου στόχου μα, χωρί να επιδείξουμε αλαζονία. Σήμερα πλέον μπορούμε να ισχυριζόμαστε ότι κατά το μεγαλύτερο μέρο ανακατασκευάστηκε η καμπύλη αποδόσεων του ελληνικού δημοσίου, συμπληρώθηκαν τα κενά τη με παράλληλη ενίσχυση τη ρευστότητα των ελληνικών κρατικών χρεογράφων, δημιουργώντα το σύνολο σχεδόν των απαραίτητων σημείων αναφορά σε όλο το φάσμα των λήξεων. Σε όλα τα παραπάνω, φυσικά το πρόγραμμα PPP τη ΕΚΟΤΟΥ, τη Ευρωπαϊκή Κεντρική Τράπεζα, βοήθησε σημαντικά. Βεβαίω το PPP. Εκτό τη Ελλάδα, βοήθησε κατά αναλογία και τι λοιπέ χώρε τη Ευρωζώνη, οι οποίε έτσι κι αλλιώ απολάμβαναν τα ευεργετικά πλεονεκτήματα και αποτελέσματα του προγράμματο ποσοτική χαλάρωση, του γνωστού QE. Υπενθυμίζεται επίση ότι η απόδοση των δεκαετών ομολόγων του ελληνικού δημοσίου έφτασε σε ιστορικά χαμηλά επίπεδα, παρόμοια με τα σημερινά, ακόμη και στα μέσα Φεβρουαρίου του 2020, πριν την πανδημία και πριν ενεργοποιηθεί το PPP. Αυτό καταδεικνύει σαφέστατα ότι πέραν τη όποια ευπρόσδεκτη και εξαιρετικά σημαντική βοήθεια απολαμβάνει η χώρα από του διάφορου ευρωπαϊκού θεσμού, για την επενδυτική κοινότητα μεγαλύτερη ίσω αξία έχει η έντονη επιθυμία και δέσμευση τη ελληνική δημοκρατία για εφαρμογή διαρθρωτικών μεταρρυθμίσεων. Κάτι που είναι επίση προπόθεση για την πρόσβαση στι διεθνεί αγορέ για δανεισμό με χαμηλό κόστο, τέτοιο που να διατηρεί και να βελτιώνει του δημότητα του ελληνικού δημοσίου χρέου και εν το αξιόχρεο τη χώρα. Αυτό που επιπλέον βοηθά στην επίτευξη χαμηλού κόστου χρηματοδότηση είναι η συνετή και ολιστική διαχείριση των ταμιακών διαθεσίμων του ελληνικού δημοσίου, η οποία σε συνδυασμό με την ευνοϊκή δομή του ελληνικού χαρτοφυλακίου χρέου, δηλαδή πολύ μεγάλη μέση σταθμική διάρκεια, εξαιρετικά μικρό κίνδυνο αναχρηματοδότηση και ανατιμολόγηση, refinancing και refixing risk. Σχεδόν μηδενικό επιτοκιακό και συναλλαγματικό κίνδυνο, πολύ χαμηλέ αιτήσει μεικτέ χρηματοδοτικέ ανάγκε και άλλα, παρέχει τι απαραίτητε διασφαλίσει στου επενδυτέ ότι το ελληνικό δημόσιο είναι ικανό να εκπληρώνει τι δανειακέ του υποχρεώσει υπό όλε τι συνθήκε για μεγάλο χρονικό διάστημα, καθιστώντα την περίπτωση τη Ελλάδα τον δείκτη χρέου προ ΑΕΠ, αν και σημαντικό, να εκτιμάται από του ειδικού ω σχετικά αδιάφορο. Ο δρόμο τη επιστροφή στην εκδοτική κανονικότητα ήταν τελικά μακρύ. Ο σχεδιασμό αυτού του εγχειρήματο ξεκίνησε το Δεκέμβριο του 2012, αμέσω μετά την επαναγορά χρέου που έλαβε η χώρα τότε. Τότε υπήρχε η πεποίθηση ότι θα διαρκούσε δύο με τρία χρόνια. 
Προφανώ η επιστροφή ήταν πολύ πιο περίπλοκη και πολύ μεγαλύτερη διάρκεια, αποκτώντα χαρακτηριστικά μια σύγχρονη Οδύσσια, αφού για περίπου μια δεκαετία, εκτό άλλων, χρειάστηκαν τρία προγράμματα διάσωση και δημοσιονομική προσαρμογή, καθώ και η εφαρμογή εκ μέρου τη χώρα μεγάλου μέρου και αριθμού διαρθρωτικών μεταρρυθμίσεων. Αλλά το όλο εγχείρημα κατέστη τελικά εφικτό. Χάρη σε όλα αυτά, μπορούμε για παράδειγμα σήμερα, εκτό των 200 ετών τη ανεξαρτησία μα, να γιορτάζουμε και την ανασύσταση τη ελληνική καμπύλη αποδόσεων. Με σεβασμό λοιπόν στην ιστορία, πρόσφατη και παρελθούσα, τιμάμε τι προσπάθειε όλων, αναγνωρίζοντα ταυτόχρονα την αλληλεγγύη που παρασχέθηκε για μία ακόμη φορά από του ευρωπαϊκού θεσμού και του ευρωπαίου εταίρου, διαβεβαιώνοντα παράλληλα ότι τα καλύτερα έπονται, αφού θα γίνει ό,τι είναι απαραίτητο ώστε να βελτιωθεί περαιτέρω και από κάθε άποψη το σημερινό καθιστώς των ελληνικών κρατικών χρεογράφων. Ευχαριστώ. Thank, uh, thank And thanks for the, your estimate of the outturn on the public debt, 205% of GDP. Uh, the 209% I mentioned obviously based on estimates. We don't know yet the final fiscal outturn for 2020 later this month. I think we'll we'll find that out, or well, some of you may know already a bit more than me. Um, so 205% um, still, so that's about a 25 percentage point increase um, on, on the previous year, well, obviously the pandemic uh, effect, which we'll talk a bit more about. Now, let me introduce our, our, our final speaker for this panel, and that is uh, Colin Ellis, Chief uh, Credit Officer um, for EMEA at Moody's. Welcome, Colin. Thank you very much, uh, Joan, and thank you indeed to the organisers um, for letting me be a part of what is, I think, a fantastic panel. Um, the fundamental question here is whether Greek debt uh, is sustainable. And... There's a really simple way of answering that because I work for a credit rating agency. Uh, if your debt is sustainable, you avoid a default. Uh, and what we did last year was we upgraded Greece's sovereign rating uh, to BA3 on our rating scale uh, with a stable outlook. Now, that's represented a, a long path of reform and adjustment that's taken many, many years. But it's really important. I, a lot of people get excited about the difference between investment grade and speculative grade ratings. But for me, the difference between being a BA rated entity versus a single B credit is really where this question of debt sustainability bites. Uh, if we are worried as a credit rating agency that debts will be unsustainable uh, and ultimately there will be some form of default, if there's any chance of that, if we think there's any material instance of that happening, uh, we will typically only assign a single B rating at the highest Uh, possible outcome. It, it requires us to have a degree of confidence and certainty that default will be avoided to assign a BA rating to an issuer. So from our perspective, we're sending a very clear signal uh, that we do think uh, Greece's debt is sustainable over the longer term. And the one particular aspect I want to talk about is um, what Director General uh, Tsakonis uh, just um, touched on as well. We completely agree with a lot of what's been said um, by Minister Skylakakis and uh, by Rolf in terms of the opportunities over the near term uh, with the EU funds coming in and the investment gap and the institutional reforms that are already ongoing that will help speed up the judiciary and deal with the still high levels of non-performing exposures that we see in the banking system. But really, one of the fundamental differences with Greece is the nature of its debt. Uh, and it reflects the extraordinary support provided by its euro area um, colleagues, which often isn't the case where we see highly indebted sovereigns in, the, in other parts of the world. The simple fact is the maturity profile, the financing needs for Greece uh, over the next two decades even, uh, are not particularly challenging. Uh, the government has worked hard to build up a cash buffer. Uh, it has very good visibility on when it will need to come to the market and issue debt. Uh, and by and large, there is growing investor confidence uh, that this will all be managed correctly. Over the long term, there is still the challenge of how Greece ultimately refinances all of its official sector obligations by returning to private sector capital markets. But that is a very long term issue. Uh, I think as it stands, the average maturity on ESM uh, funding to Greece is still over 30 years, but 
uh, Rolf can correct me if I'm wrong there. And I think some of the outstanding EFSF funding, which um, first came into place, is actually over 40 years. So there is a lot of time to deal with this. And importantly, uh, the fact that Euro area creditors have indicated their willingness to provide further relief if needed uh, underpins the confidence that private sector investors can have uh, in, in Greek sovereign debt. It's really important to remember that our ratings, our assessment of Greeks' credit worthiness, is only speaking about private sector creditors. We're only ever thinking about whether private creditors see a default and suffer losses. And, and that matters because ordinarily, uh, if we saw a maturity extension or a cut in a coupon, those are exactly the kinds of things that we would consider to be a default. And if we saw a risk of that happening, you'd see uh, a lower rating for any entity, certainly lower than the BA3 rating we currently have for Greece. But what we've seen over the past few years is the pattern is that Euro area creditors are happy to restructure their own obligations. They're happy to push back maturities. You know, they're happy to cut coupons, although uh, it may be difficult to cut them much lower given uh, the low financing costs that are out there now. And they're happy to do that without imposing similar restrictions on private sector creditors. As long as that remains the case, as long as private sector creditors do not have to participate in any future maturity extension, um, should Greece require further support going forwards. I think we have a strong case to believe uh, that Greek debt will be sustainable. Uh, and there will, of course, be challenges along the way. But ultimately, um, we want to acknowledge the progress that we've seen over the past few years, the support that's still in place from your area creditors. Uh, and that was why we um, reflected all of those positive developments in our upgrade to BA3 in November of last year. And again, if we're doing our job properly, uh, that's a strong signal that we do not expect a default going forwards, and hence that the debt is sustainable. Thank you, Joan. Thank you very much, Colin. Okay, we have some time. Um, we have about 10 minutes um, before we have to head for a, a break. So um, what we've heard so far has been actually incredibly positive and uh, fairly sanguine about the um, outlook um, for debt sustainability in Greece, um, and also, of course, about the government's plans, the use of the Recovery and Resilience Fund to try to boost growth alongside um, domestic reforms of the business environment and so on. So that's all really good, but maybe we should just um, uh, start off with looking at potential challenges because several of you have mentioned them. So just to explore them further. So I guess the first, the obvious one is about this ultra low interest rate environment that we're in. You know, we don't really see that changing um, in the short term. But what would it take um, for that to change? Um, you know, how are you uh, looking at those risks, um, all of you? over the you know beyond the you know the next few years over the medium term so that's the first question about interest rates and my the second question um is about the primary surplus targets which several of you have mentioned and obviously have been uh, waived um during the pandemic uh, suspended uh, if you like and we expect that to remain the case obviously this year and maybe into next year but um, I'd like to hear your perspectives on that and are we like once um, these are reimposed are we likely to see the same targets coming back into play and just to remind people who are following this that was um, for primary surplus uh, targets of 3.5% of GDP up to 2022 and um, uh, thereafter um, indefinitely 2.2% um, uh, um, over the longer term. So um, what's your perspective on on the reimposition of those targets? And maybe we can start first of all uh, with Rolf. Yeah, thank you very much. And also thanks for the other contributors. And the, the, clearly the point that um, Colin made is, is very important about also the contributions that we can give to debt sustainability or have given to debt sustainability through our terms of lending. Now, on the two questions that, that you raise, um, first, we do a debt sustainability analysis jointly with the other institutions. 
As part of that, the sustainability analysis, we also look at interest rates and we actually do assume an increase in interest rates in the medium to long term, not in the short term, but in the medium to long term. And we also look at, so to speak, um, adverse scenarios, how that may evolve. So, and our conclusion is that Greek debt is, debt is sustainable, even with a anticipated increase in interest rates. So. From that perspective, uh, there is a certain, if you wish, safety margin built in here. And one should also be clear that obviously with the maturity structure and the lengthening of the maturity structure, any interest rate increase will only materialize over time. So on the second question, and I think here one can be very clear, the key objective of the agreed fiscal targets, primary targets, um, in the past was that Greece is able to comply with the Stability and Growth Pact. This is what was the, what was gave the benchmark, the yardstick for formulating the long-term uh, primary surplus targets. And I think that yardstick remains forward-looking. And at this current stage, you also know that Greece, as the other countries, in a way benefits from the degree of freedom you get by invoking the general escape clause, which is rightly considered necessary in order to react appropriately to the crisis. So from that perspective, I think there is clear continuity also in terms of the policy objectives going forward. Thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe the alternate minister. Mr. Skilakakis would like to give some thoughts on this. You did obviously spend the early part of your talk um, with the focus on um, the burden of these primary surplus targets um, and the impact on growth, which we clearly saw in recent years. Um, I, we, we can't hear you. I think maybe you're muted at the moment, Minister. Yes. No, no I'm not. Uh, so thank you for the questions. Uh, let's first start with the uh, uh, realization that our budget was uh, 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 overperforming uh, uh, in uh, the uh, past uh, few years before the crisis in terms of primary primary surplus. In fact, uh, uh, more than actually agreed. Uh, we have uh, managed to hit the targets uh, uh, year by year, and this, the structure of the budget, in its essence, has not changed. What uh, 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 we now have is uh, the decisions that are going to be made by Europe, uh, Eurozone countries and Europe in general on how we're going to go forward after the crisis. Our intention is not to uh, miss any of the targets that will be applied uh, in terms of the rules that will be uh, 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 enforced after 2023 and after and uh, for us this is extremely important we want to have the ability to be in uh, a safe fiscal environment exactly because of the need to cover this investment gap uh, i didn't uh, enter that into the situation but in the first years uh, after the crisis, the main reason for the investment gap, the initial pre-crisis, was of course the country risk. Now, we don't want to enter into uh, an area of country risk uh, in the foreseeable future. Thus, we're going to achieve our targets. The targets will be based, of course, on the output gap, uh, and the, the how fast uh, you uh, the, the, each country uh, moves towards the uh, the 
common European debt uh, uh, target of 60%. So uh, uh, these are important issues in, in terms of uh, fiscal planning. Uh, we don't know how things will evolve uh, after the crisis in terms of these decisions, but we are prepared to meet whatever these decisions are our targets. And uh, most uh, importantly, uh, the increase of, uh, of interest rates for the Greek debt is going to be uh, uh, influencing the debt only partially because, uh, as you know, the percentage of uh, new debt that we have to issue is not relative to the, the total Greek debt uh, 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 but uh, uh, because of the long maturities of the debt to official creditors. So uh, for us, there is a long, uh, uh, the, the ability to, to adjust to an increase of interest rates, uh, uh, which is much better than other Eurozone countries, because uh, the, the part the, the influence of higher interest rates is will be a lot smaller in the short and medium, medium term than uh, in our other Eurozone uh, counterparts. Uh, this is an advantage of, of uh, early warning, I would say, for changing of policies. But uh, Greece is going to be fiscally very uh, 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 responsible uh, in the years to to come, uh, and uh, I, I am certain about that uh, because there is also, uh, in terms of the Greek society at large and the Greek economy, a consensus on that. There are no uh, 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 political forces that are in the mainstream uh, of the uh, Greek political spectrum that now uh, are, uh, uh, are offering any other uh, political solution than uh, fiscal uh, sustainability. Uh, thus, uh, both in terms of the political spectrum and in terms of what we are actually doing, we are going to follow a, f a fiscally responsible uh, policy. And uh, this has been obvious because Greece, uh, and that does not happen for every other European country, did not have any permanent measures within its, its budget during this uh, uh, period of the general escape uh, uh, clause. All our measures are uh, uh, up till now strictly, strictly extraordinary, and they don't have a long-term influence on our budget. And whatever measures that will be uh, possibly finalized uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of labor cost and, uh, high, and high taxing on capital will be within the targets that we will agree with the European institutions. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, I think those two questions I asked have been covered. Um, a question from the audience, from Solon Molho, question for Mr. Tsakonas. Considering the importance of rebuilding Greece's yield curve on all maturities as a base for the wider economy, what are the agency's plans going forward? Thank you for the question. Uh, we are going to continue what we have done so far. It has been designed since 2012, as I mentioned in my, in my intervention. We are going to continue providing more supply in the context of the rebuilding of our real care. Uh, we are going to fill in the gaps of the maturity spectrum, uh, providing additional supply, making uh, the secondary market more efficient, 
because our target is the following. We want to make our securities, the Greek government securities, more attractive to international investors. Uh, therefore, we need to improve the secondary market, market's liquidity and the secondary market's operation. This will lead to a, a more narrow, let's say, to the narrowing of the bid offer spreads. This leads to uh, make our uh, securities attractive, more attractive to investors, secure, uh, to investors community. This leads in its way to, uh, to more appetite to, uh, to uh, um, uh, increased appetite of investors. And this increases also in its turn uh, the prices. Increasing prices means uh, uh, lower yields. Lower yields means lower spreads versus other Eurozone peers. And in a nutshell, we are going to have a yield curve, an efficient yield curve with low interest rates. And this will have an extremely positive impact for the valuation of the fair value of all Greek assets. This leads to a GDP uh, increase, which leads in its turn, because I'm a mathematician and I, li I like this uh, way, let's say, of thinking, this leads to a better debt to GDP ratio. As far as your previous question is concerned, just a couple of numbers. Uh, our weighted average maturity, I'm referring to the Greek public debt, is more than 20 years. Our floating element is less or close to 1%. So we have almost zero interest rate exposure, zero FX exposure. The time to net refixing, which is the most important factor, is close to 19 years. I this in a natural means that in weighted average terms, our... <clears throat> Our annual, actual annual interest payments will not exceed for a long period of time, close to 20 years, 6 billion. In a, in a sense, we have immunized the risks coming from the numerator of our problem. Now it's the time to be concentrated on the denominator, i.e. the GDP growth. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. I have a question, um, Colin. I'm not sure if you want to tackle it, um, or, or you know, do so if you if you want to, or give your other remarks. And the question is from Nicholas Karavitis, Professor of Public Finance at Pantheon University. And this is his question: If we see national debt sustainability through the lens of European debt sustainability, then should we not ask whether the current state of economic integration of the EU, fiscal, financial market, labour market, social security and so on, and therefore political integration is adequate and can absorb rather than contribute to any fiscal pressures that arise from the structural asymmetries and imbalances within the EU, Mr. Strauk. Also might want to quite comment on that. I'm not sure, but Colin, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big question, obviously. Um, it, it, it is, but um, I, I, I might have a stab. Thank you, Joan, and, and then uh, Rolf can correct me. Um, I, you know, the, the reason that we have different sovereign ratings for different euro area member states fundamentally reflects the institutional architecture of the single currency area at the moment. There is a common monetary policy. There is a common currency. There is different fiscal policy. Uh, and until recently, uh, it looked like that was going to continue. And, and you know, the, the, the question is absolutely right. That, that is part of what drove the three sovereign defaults we saw in the euro area in 2012 and 2013. Now, one of the striking things about the EU's recovery plans is we have, for the first time, a substantial amount of common debt being issued centrally and then dispersed to countries as grants. Uh, not as loans. And Greece is one of the big beneficiaries of that. So, so that is a first step towards a different kind of institutional architecture, where, to put it very, very simply, um, debts and fiscal measures are pooled. But it is only a first step. Uh, and, we, and this is where the political policy choices will be critical um, going forwards uh, in terms of how this plays out. Could, could we eventually get to a place where in essence, there is a single sovereign rating for all euro area countries. Yes, that, that is a possibility. Um, but I think it is a long, long way away for the moment. Uh, I, th I think we're a long way from a full fiscal uni union with mutualization of debts. Um, and frankly, uh, given I, I think the policy focus at the moment is rightly on how 
recovery is generated with the funds and with the focus on digital and, and climate uh, and other issues. One one small remark I did just want to make in response to the other questions, because um, I think I agree with everything that's been said around uh, interest rates uh, and the investment gap. But this trade off between primary deficits and growth, uh, which uh, again, ultimately, the, the pri sorry, primary surpluses, not deficits. Greece has been running primary surpluses and has been exceeding its targets, uh, exactly as uh, Minister Skilakak has said. I'm a little bit cautious about expecting too much extra growth from a slightly lower primary surplus target, because essentially that's back to being a question about fiscal multipliers. And I know those are very uncertain and they vary depending on the type of fiscal stimulus that you're talking about. But my best guess is still that the average there is below one. So while some easing uh, in any primary surplus target may, of course, be welcome, it, it may not be a one for one translation in terms of what you see in growth going forwards. Uh, but I, I will stop there. Thanks. I'm afraid we actually have to stop here as well. I know we, we a lot of questions have been raised and, and probably you all want to jump in now and answer some of them. But uh, we've we've gone over our time and I know the next panel is, is connected uh, and we have to have a five minute break. One so, minute. Can, can what, I one minute. One I, minute. I will allow you. Yes. Yes, of course. OK. Uh, the emphasis of the government is not to generate um, uh, uh, growth through uh, uh, smaller uh, primary surpluses. Uh, uh, it's not to have primary surpluses that will suppress growth. The main effort for growth is and will be through reforms. Reforms and mobilizing private investment. But uh, 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 this uh, uh, should not be suppressed by too high uh, uh, primary surpluses. So, uh, as we say uh, in Greece, the, the ancient Greek metron, the, the ability to, to, to go in a steady and, and uh, measured way is the way forward. So, no excess. That's what uh, 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 the government believes in, in any, in any okay. way, either one or the other. Okay, I'm sure Rolf and, and, and Colin are very pleased to hear that ending. Um, and that will be uh, the last word there. So thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry we couldn't continue for longer, but it's been really excellent discussion. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, uh, every, we, we really appreciate it. And we're going to have a five minute break now. So see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Water is needed by all living things. Something so simple and essential from which all things may grow. Its purity was once a given, but the influence of man has increased levels of nitrates in the world's fresh water sources. In nature, there's a balance between nitrates in soil, water, and plants. Good for plants, but bad for humans. Nitrates are a natural component of the soil and part of the nitrogen cycle. When plants die, nitrates are released into the soil and serve as food for the synthesis of proteins and other nitrogen compounds. Human activity disrupts this balance through intensive use of nitrate-loaded fertilizers in agriculture. The leftover surplus of nitrates, along with animal waste, contaminates groundwater and can also infiltrate spring water sources. When ingested, nitrates may have serious long-term consequences, including high blood pressure, blood poisoning, severe cyanosis, and some types of cancer in mammals. Our young are the most vulnerable as they lack the means to fight back. In infants, nitrates can cause gastric problems, hives and rashes, and blue baby syndrome. Even small quantities consumed by pregnant mothers have been shown to cause birth defects. Tasteless, colorless, and odorless, nitrates are found in almost every natural spring water on the market. Except for Aqua Carpatica. The 40-year journey of our springs naturally filters nitrates out of the water. Aqua Carpatica is the only brand in the world with naturally nitrate-free mineral water. 
the healthiest choice for you, the ones you love, and the little ones still on the way. Experience Water Love from Aqua Carpatica, the water that loves you back. Visit us today and learn more. AquaCarpatica.com. Hello everyone and welcome to session three of this Economist virtual event. Uh, the session we're now starting is entitled Greek Public Debt, A Tale of Two Centuries. And in this session we're going to take a step back from the focus on the present situation regarding Greece's public debt uh, and take a deeper look at the economic, political, social other factors uh, that have shaped Greece's publances historically. And we have four esteemed experts in the field to set the scene for our later discussions about the Greek sovereign debt crisis of 2009 and afterwards and the bailout era. Uh, so let me welcome each of uh, the speakers uh, in turn. Uh, we have Christoph Trebesch, Director of, the, of International Finance and Macroeconomics, Research Centre at Kiel Institute for the World Economy, Professor of Macroeconomics, Kiel University. Kostas Axeloglu, Dean and Professor of International Business and Strategy at Albert Graduate Business School at the American College of Greece. Panayotis Liagoras, Jan Monet Professor at the University of the Peloponnese, author Greeks Public Debt and Daniel Gross, member of the board and distinguished fellow at the Centre for European Policy Studies. Welcome all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, 
Each of you, I believe, have got four or five minutes to give some introductory remarks, uh, and then we'll carry on with our discussion uh, for about 20 minutes afterwards. So let's start with Christoph Trebesch. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yes, hello. Thanks so much for the kind invitation. I'm honored to be part of this uh, excellent event. Um, so I will focus my remarks on uh, some of the key takeaways from a long run project that I had conducted with Carmen Reinhardt uh, of Harvard University, currently at the World Bank, uh, on the history of Greek debt and default over the past 200 years. Um, and I'd like to focus on two key points. The first key point is just how uh, striking the parallels of the four major default waves that uh, Greece went through uh, have been. Um, so in, we had four major um, uh, defaults in the 1820s, uh, so in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, which started basically prior to independence. Uh, we had uh, the crisis of the 1890s, we had the crisis of the interwar years, and we had uh, the last crisis of the 2000, early 2010s. In each of these crises, uh, we had each of each crisis was preceded by a borrowing boom uh, from finance from foreign private creditors. Um, these creditors um, could not be repaid at some point. There was a debt overhang situation um, followed by a default and uh, bailout money coming in. Uh, in uh, uh, the, the early uh, 19th century, it were the imperial powers that started to guarantee loans. Uh, in the interwar years, it was the League of Nations, and of course, in the in the in the last crisis, it was the Troika. Um, this uh, bailout money came, of course, with strings attached in each, in each uh, case, uh, with uh, fiscal austerity, uh, political interference from abroad, uh, and a long uh, period of uh, you know. Uh, uh, fiscal retrenchment. Um, and it is one, one of the striking facts is just how long the shadow of these official bailouts have been in some cases. So let me give you one example. Um, the loan of 1833 uh, was initially financed by private creditors. Uh, as when Greeks could not repay this loan, it was guaranteed by the uh, Troika of the day, the Great Britain, uh, Russia, and France. Um, and after multiple restructurings, reschedulings, uh, and 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 uh, a long period of fiscal austerity, the, these loans were still out on the balance sheet of the Greek state 100 years later. So this is the, these official assistance, these official bailouts have a lot, very low, long shadow. And uh, if history is any lesson, uh, this is a warning for the current situation, uh, whether the large official debts that Greece is still owes uh, will have a similarly long shadow. Okay, this is the first point I'd like to make. The second point I'd like to make is the crucial role of domestic versus external debt. So to understand um, uh, the predicament of Greece's political, economic, um, and financial situations, it's crucial to understand that uh, Greece has been relying on foreign financing uh, for a very long time. Um, uh, the, and, and the last crisis is, is, is just one of the four examples. Uh, I explained that the borrowing boom in each case was financed from abroad. And this was also true uh, for the 2000s. So Greece was one of the Eurozone countries with the highest share of foreign holders of its debt. More than 70% of the debt uh, of the Greek government bonds were held abroad. Uh, so this, the crisis of 2011 and 12 it was, was, was clearly a public debt crisis, but it was also to a very large extent a external debt crisis. Um, in fact, the external dependence of Greece and of many other countries that, you know, in Latin America, Carmen had written on being addicted to dollars, right, addicted to foreign foreign savings, um, uh, this, these, um, uh, this external dependence comes with unpleasant side effects. And those include, of course, sudden stops 
Uh, and the Eurozone crisis to a large degree was such a sudden stop event, specifically if we look at the uh, GIPS countries. Um, and it comes with this political, uh, with the political strings attached. It comes with nasty creditor conflicts, um, with for conflicts with foreign creditors. Um, so looking ahead, um, you know, one 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 lesson from the from the paper we have written is uh, that uh, the, 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 there might be lessons learned from other other countries that have graduated from this heavy foreign uh, external dependence when it comes to financing, um, and and to broaden the domestic sources of finance. That's of course not a panacea, uh, but it is certainly one ingredient um, in how Greece could uh, you know break the spell of of repeated. Um, uh, borrowing booms and followed by defaults. Uh, so, so uh, this focus on on domestic lending, on domestic sources of financing, seems like a, a very important theme when thinking about you know the, the bigger picture on, on the history of Greek debt. And with that, I end. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Christoph. So, uh, our next speaker is Kostas Axaloglu. Welcome, Kostas. Um, thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on uh, the time zone you are. Uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks for uh, putting together this important conference uh, to facilitate the dialogue among uh, uh, all of us. Um, uh, I will very briefly connect the past, the present and the future in four minutes. Um, uh, Research shows that uh, the over-indebtedness of Greece in the past, in the last uh, two centuries, was usually associated with major disruptions in the country, uh, wars, uh, epidemics, uh, major um, depressions around the globe. Also, research shows that um, the high debt-to-GDP ratio, if it's above 90%, is associated with uh, lower GDP growth. And if uh, the external debt as uh, Christoph has suggested, um, the GDP ratio is above 90%. This cuts in half the growth uh, rate of, uh, of the country. These are very important elements because, as Christoph said in a very influential study with Carmen Reinhardt, that a um, significant part of the Greek debt is, international, is, is external debt. And this is due to the fact that uh, the propensity of savings in Greece is quite low, so we don't create a lot of savings to support um, uh, the debt domestically from domestic uh, creditors. Um, significant part of uh, these savings are channeled to real estate or abroad and not to financial instruments like debt and uh, so on. And also Greece is a small economy, so we cannot develop enough resources to support uh, high debt. Now, of course, under these circumstances, the month of uh, the debt is uh, challenging. Um, a recessionary fiscal policy and austere me measures of uh, higher taxes, we have experienced that uh, in the last uh, 10 years, um, bring the country in a deeper recession. Debt restructuring is not easy um, in many cases because a significant part of uh, the debt is uh, to international um, creditors. And therefore, the way forward is economic growth so that the economic growth of the country can finance um, uh, the particular uh, debt. Now, that's the present that connects us now to the future. If economic growth is the way forward uh, to make the debt of the country sustainable, then we are in front of a major, a major challenge as a society to develop our new growth model. Our new growth model that depends on uh, innovation and investments, as uh, Minister Skelakaitis mentioned, um, develop an outward-looking economy with a, a group of uh, companies that are, uh, uh, have a strategic focus to the, to the global market. And of course, uh, this type of an economy, that this innovations economy uh, and outward, with outward-looking um, business uh, community uh, can really gain a lot from uh, the global economy and grow quickly. So developing a new growth model is the challenge. And we have, I think, the unique opportunity right now through the recovery and resilience facility and plan, this important plan for the whole Europe that were part of it, 
I think that we have in front of us a major funding opportunity to finance this new growth model. It is very challenging. It is not easy. But I think that, uh, and I will close with that, I think that uh, we are all are united under the same cause to contribute, to develop um, this new growth model, the academia, the business world, institutions, the government. And this is our debt to the future generations because they will be paying off the debt we have accumulated. Thank you very much. Much indeed, uh, Kostas. And uh, so let me now introduce Panayotis, Leo Govas. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Joan. Um, thank you for this invitation. It's a pre it is really a very important topic and uh, uh, concerns all of us. Uh, my uh, presentation here is going to be focused on my, one of my books, which is on public debt of Greece. In this book, I had the opportunity to to, 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 to look at all these uh, debts that uh, Greece was involved uh, throughout these two centuries. So uh, in this book, I saw that uh, there are historical patterns, that we have a reproduction of the phenomenon of uh, over independence, uh, over uh, indebtedness. The modern Greek led in experience already began with the revolution of 1821 and continues to date. We observe constant trends over time, trends that uh, have to do with the behavior of political leaderships, the behavior of the state, the behavior of the political parties, the behavior of lenders and borrowers, and the behavior of citizens. To date, Greece has been unable to service uh, its debts four times. After its bank bankruptcy, Greece was excluded from the markets for a long time. There are repeated and slow negotiations with lenders, international audits, and accounting tricks by the Greek governments. Eventually, a compromise was reached between the Greek governments and the lenders, and then the country started to borrow new loans. A new vicious cycle of over indebtedness and borrowing would start then. History helps us to learn and avoid the mistakes of the past. It is up to us whether we will learn eventually uh, something from our history, whether we will be able to do something to overcome the crisis, whether or not the series of mistakes will start again, whether we will provoke our luck or whether we will try to prevent uh, new episodes of defaults. It is not, to my opinion, just enough to, to find a settlement for this or the other debt, but to develop ideas on how we can uh, overcome these historical patterns. Coming back to, to my book, I have uh, found that there are 10 repeated features in, in, in the history of public debt. To go over them, and then we can discuss, we have, one can see many examples, uh, uh, repeated examples throughout these two centuries. First, first, we have four defaults, official defaults, in 1827, in 1893, in 1897, and in 1932. The last one in 2010 was unofficial, was, not, uh, was avoided officially. Second, we, we observe uh, long-standing ne negotiations with the lenders, very delayed negotiations, with full of uncertainty, full of fear, full, like the one in 2015 uh, that was uh, uncertainty all over the economy and uh, the fear of Brexit. Third. We observe international audits in, in many occasions. Fourth, we observe political upheavals and proposals to prosecute those responsible for mismanagement at trial. 
For example, Karilaos Trikoupis, uh, uh, Prime Minister of Greece in 1891, was sent to a trial. Fifth, uncertainty of Greek financial accounts and government accounting tricks. Again, there are many examples, um, not only in the period of uh, 1882-85, but also in the most recent period. Six, we have mismanagement and impressive frauds of all kinds by domestic and foreign mediators. Seven, we have ca cases of pettiness and revenge in the context of an uncontrolled internal rivalry that reduced the benefit of loans. Eight, we have greed of owners, we observe greed of owners of the international capital. Ninth, we also observe organized attempts by foreigners to deceive the government, the governments. And finally, we, have, we observe changing geostrategic orientations of the great powers and especially of the UK and France. For example, uh, the first loan of 2010 and the first memorandum effectively saved the banks of France and Germany in this case, which had been greatly exposed by lending to Greece and were in danger of collapsing at a time when the banking system had not yet recovered from the 2008 crisis. Large banking groups certainly influenced the decisions of governments at various stages and managed to gain time to transfer the Greek, uh, to, to Greek bodies the Greek securities they held. Also involved were some special export interests, mainly of France and Germany, which were linked to the purchase of weapons, weapon systems for like uh, German submarines and French frigates. So uh, I'm stopping here and uh, waiting for the next round. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So let me uh, turn now to our final speaker, Daniel Gross. Um, from the Centre for European Policy Studies. Welcome. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure uh, to be here in the presence of distinguished colleagues. Um, let me add a footnote to Christoph's uh, excellent introduction. And in doing so, uh, I'd like to make a comparison between two countries, if you want, at the periphery of Europe, one is in the southeast, that's uh, Greece, and the other one is in the southwest, which is Portugal. And I think uh, Portugal has today a similar GDP per capita as Greece, and um, also has a very checkered history uh, with its public debt. Um, it has also defaulted several times in the 19th century. Perhaps in the 20th century it was luckier because it didn't participate in the in the Second World War. But it is certainly also a country with a uh, problematic history of uh, of a foreign debt. Now, what I want to emphasize is that uh, the difference lies very often in how a country reacts to a crisis situation. And let me illustrate that uh, with uh, two variables, one of which uh, Christoph already mentioned, that when you have a country with a low savings rate, uh, then you uh, quickly get into a situation where the country runs a current account deficit, because otherwise you can't uh, finance a decent uh, level of domestic uh, investment. Now, the interesting uh, fact for me, at least, about uh, the savings rate in Greece is that, depending on the period you look at, actually it used to be high. In the 1990s, uh, up to 2000, uh, Greece actually was a high savings rate economy. And uh, what is interesting or astonishing is that, for reasons which I have difficulties to fathom, this savings rate uh, went down way before your area entry um, and then uh, went down even more uh, during uh, 
the boom years preceding the bust. But then what I find uh, even more interesting is that if you compare that to Portugal, which traditionally had lower uh, savings rate, when the crunch came, in Portugal savings were more or less maintained, whereas in Greece they declined even further. And of course, if you have that kind of reaction, then you get into a sort of a vicious circle. Uh, exactly at the time when you need uh, more domestic resources to uh, repay your creditors and also to invest in your own future, uh, domestic savings become scarcer. And that, of course, uh, makes uh, the possibility to, to, uh, uh, to repay your foreign debt uh, even more remote increases the risk premium that foreign creditors will ask for. And of course, that has a further negative impact. So it is uh, not so much the level of Greek savings, which were, as I said, high, but then declining, but it's the reaction to the crisis which made things worse. And the second uh, uh, aspect where, again, one sees the reaction to the crisis is uh, the, the openness of the economy. Uh, the Greek economy has been rather closed for a long time for reasons that are for me very difficult to understand because after all it's a very small economy and economists always say small open economy whereas Greece uh, was at least uh, a very small relatively closed economy and since you repay foreign debt with exports basically or an excess of exports over imports uh, this is very important because uh, with an uh, open economy it's easier to generate the increase in exports and here again the contrast between portugal and greece is striking at least for the last crisis um, after the crisis in portugal exports started to grow very quickly. Portugal, which was already a more open economy than Greece, became even more open. And these exports were instrumental also in uh, limiting the fall in GDP and the increase in unemployment. Whereas in Greece, exports really for the first years increased very little, although actually Greek wages went down much more than Portugal. And here again, of course, we have a uh, sort of not positive circle at least, in the sense that when the going gets tough, uh, when you have to repay your foreign creditors, and when you actually need more exports, um, it didn't happen in Greece. Uh, whereas it happened in other countries. And uh, I submit to you that this different reaction to a crisis was the reason why Portugal was able to graduate, right? It was also a default prone country but uh, basically it came at least to this crisis uh, it came under stress but it came out without having to default whereas uh, greece did and uh, i would therefore propose to you that we should really look at how the country reacts to tough times if tough times lead, lead to lead sorry to uh, less savings and uh, not a uh, vigorous export growth, then the country is just not prepared for crisis. And that should make us think uh, when we look at the very high level of Greek debt, which for the time being I know is no problem, but what will come later uh, when the debt slowly graduates into private hands and 20, 30 years from now when we have the next crisis, would Greece then be better prepared? Well, thank you very much. Thanks all of you for keeping to the time. That means we've got some a uh, good amount of time for discussion um, and, and questions. So um, again, I'd like to encourage um, our audience to send in questions um, through the platform uh, if you want to put questions to the speakers. Um, but um, well, let's kick off uh, the discussion. Very interesting, all of you, your um, presentations, and it's good to have that historical perspective and um, as uh, Christoph outlined, very, very striking parallels in all these um, crises. So 
I guess the question for you, uh, Christoph, is um, how it could have been done differently or how could Greece have uh, escaped um, uh, this kind of repeated pattern? Um, you know, because this just begs the question, begs another question of why and why not? Why was Greece unable to... Uh, break out of this dependency, and you, you know, you, you you talked about other countries that have actually managed to do something different. It'd be good to hear, I think, a little more. Maybe you could give us some examples of countries that have done this um, in terms of shifting um, from a dependence on foreign financing to domestic financing. I think you're muted, um, Christoph. Can't hear you. Sorry. Um, there is now a, a long, a, a very broad literature and economics focusing on these historical legacy, right? So we were asking why. Uh, I would say Greece started out very unfortunate. The first loan uh, was basically uh, risen before Greece became independent by, um, uh, and then uh, that built up after the uh, 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 Bavarian king uh, ruled the country, uh, and, and this debt, in a way, never um, th these debt problems just 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 stayed in there. So the I think the first century uh, is an unfortunate mix of events. I, I fully agree, however, with Daniel. Uh, gro uh, gross, um, that it is crucial how a country reacts in crisis times and also the lessons learned. Um, and one striking example are the Asian countries after 1998. Uh, the, the, the crisis of, of, of uh, 1997 in, in Thailand, uh, uh, Malaysia, um, etc., um, was a crisis of external indebtedness, short run, uh, often uh, yeah, uh, squandered projects in real estate and other sectors of, of these chables, etc. Uh, but Asia um, learned its lesson in the sense with with regard to the question you were asking on domestic versus external. Uh, Asia, many of these countries built up war chests in foreign reserves. Um, they and they shifted towards more domestic, uh, domestically oriented debt. They they they. Um, one, one key motivation was really this, this the negative experience with the external interference, IMF programs, etc. Um, whether that was justified or not is another question, but, but certainly the last state to, is to move towards domestic lending. And that's also true for some countries in, in Latin America, uh, for example, Peru. Uh, Brazil is now uh, largely financing itself from domestic um, sources. Uh, which helps to buffer many of these political shocks, many of the turbulence, much of the turbulence they are currently going through. Um, but, but, but like like Daniel, I agree that the debt, the, the debt and financing part is only one side of the story. The other is really um, exports uh, and, and 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 being prepared, you know, opening opening up um, and. Uh, building a strong export base and building, uh, maybe that's the more, the key part is really building a stronger domestic um, economy uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, long-term investments uh, at home. Um, and, you know, there, there's plenty to do at the moment, uh, the green revolution, digitization. Uh, so there are uh, many opportunities and I'm certain you know, there's a lot of positive dynamic at the moment. So this is, uh, and and um, this was already mentioned today, right? Um, that that this focus on growth uh, is, is is really crucial and on, uh, certainly not easy. Uh, but but it is as as all these questions. It is a very complex interplay uh, between the financing side, uh, the external sector, uh, domestic political economy issues, and of course growth potential issues. Um, so so that, those are just a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very difficult to un unravel um, these kind of historical and structural issues from um, questions that Daniel um, alluded to of 
you know, whether you want to call it political will um, or a will to reform. Um, so I guess you could say that um, not only was the dependency on foreign external foreign powers very important in the trajectory of Greek development, but also the way in which the Greek state developed and democracy came before the development of, uh, of the Greek state. Capitalism developed quite late uh, in Greece. Um, the industrial sector has always been quite small. So there's been a lot of structural factors that have then fed into this clientelist political system as well, which have mitigated against the state addressing some of some of these problems. Um, but um, let me take some of the uh, take our speakers to respond to some of the points that have been made um, already. So, um, Kostas, did you want to respond to some of the points that have been made and to this question? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, very uh, insightful comments from all the panelists. Um, I think that uh, what Daniel said in terms of uh, it's very important to uh, to evaluate and assess how a, a society, how an economy responds in uh, a period of time of a crisis. Um, however, what happens in Greece, especially during the, the, the most recent um, uh, uh, debt crisis, it was a structural issue. The Greek economy developed as an inward-looking economy because it was a spree of consumption after the 2000. So that uh, the focus of the business community was on the local economy. Just to give you a quick, a, a quick data point, um, from 2000 to 2008, 70% of the growth of revenue in tourism in Greece was coming from Greeks, while in Portugal, 70% at the same period of time, was coming from foreigners. This shows that the Greek economy developed as an inward-looking economy. So when the crisis erupted, um, it was not easy to switch the strategic focus of companies towards the international community. I, I, I bet I'm, I'm not. You guys are more specialists in terms of that because you do much more research than I do in the topic. But I bet that the same happened throughout the centuries. The structure of the economy was not helping Greece to either um, uh, collect uh, or um, finance the debt internally, low savings rates, or uh, become a more outward-looking economy, expanding faster so that it has enough resources to support the public uh, debt. So moving towards an external debt that during the crisis was not easy to support it, and therefore the system collapsed. Thank you. Thanks, Kostas. Um, Paniotis, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, the, all the comments are very insightful, and I think I, 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 I would like to add uh, a couple of things. Um, what makes us different, I think, from other um, countries, other successful cases, uh, is that in Greece, for a long time, we had a lot of rigidities. We had rigidities in the state, in the functioning of the markets. Uh, we were not so open economy. I agree with Daniel. Um, we, we, we rather uh, had a closed economy and um, lack of competition in many markets. Uh, but I would like to add also that um, another problem was, uh, and to a certain degree still is, uh, weak institutions has to do with weak institutional base. Uh, in Greece, uh, I, 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 if you remember, uh, we, we, we used to say, you, I mean, everybody used to say that uh, the Greek statistics, uh, it was at a time when the Greek statistical authority was not very strong institution, it was very politically dependent, and the Greek statistics were not that um, credible statistics. Uh, of course, this has been, um, uh, is not the case anymore, but it was a problem. Uh, and it is related to lack of reforms. For, for a long period, for many decades in Greece, we, we avoided reforms. Why? Because there was political uh, uh, cost uh, uh, when doing reforms. And I think uh, uh, 
Uh, another issue uh, that one has to, to bear in mind when discussing about the debt issue is that um, uh, what uh, the debt, the, any discussion needs about debt is a political consensus. In Greece, there was no political consensus. Uh, there was a, a, a blame game, actually, between the parties. Uh, but as we all know, the issue of debt may need uh, technocratic doc documentation, but it is predominantly a political issue. Uh, it also needs a vision. Uh, the, the issue of debt is not offered for political and partisan conflicts, neither for blame games. It is offered for a vision because it is not only behind us, but is also in front of us. And of course, and uh, um, self-consciousness is, 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 is important. Uh, this is why the, uh, the study of history, of the Greek history, uh, can give us many, many lessons. And hopefully we will not repeat these lessons, this, uh, the bad, uh, the bad uh, experiences in the future. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to turn to Daniel now. But, um, also, I want to, for closing remarks, I just wanted to ask you your views about the sustainability of Greece's public debt. I'm not sure if you followed um, the previous session. Um, whether it was pretty, everybody was pretty sanguine um, about the outlook for uh, the debt and Greece's ability to service it and indeed grow out of its debt problem um, for several reasons, mainly short term because of the ultra low interest rate environment, but also the restructuring of the debt, the long maturities, um, and then in particular, um, I guess, with the emphasis we've heard all day from the government emphasis on Greece's new growth model um, and a possible role that the Recovery and Re Resilience Fund can play in boosting growth, Bank of Greece, two percentage points per year um, over the medium term. So I would like to hear your views um, about that because certainly, Christoph, your suggestions at the beginning uh, were more pointing to maybe a repetition of um, historical patterns. I'd like to hear your views on see things panning out for Greece in coming decades. But Daniel, let me bring you in first of all. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm much less of an expert in economic history than, than Christoph. Um, maybe also to make people aware that very often the one's judgment about the longer term are very much colored by the recent history. Um, I remember a, an OECD report from 2007, which noted that the Greek economy was actually quite dynamic, in parentheses, more dynamic than that of Portugal, and that maybe uh, corruption was oiling the wheels, and therefore it was, after all, a good thing. Uh, of course, now we... <laughs> We have a completely different view. So uh, I think we should not be impressed uh, too much by uh, the last few years. We all know, and that was mentioned in the previous session, that uh, Greek debt is uh, in safe public hands, financed at low interest rates for the medium to long term. And uh, therefore, there's very little risk of, a, uh, of another debt crisis soon. But the question is whether in 20, 30 years, when the debt hopefully has migrated, has been reduced and migrated into, into private hands, will there be a different Greece? And uh, Greece that uh, then reacts differently to the future crisis that will come, and also will have a structure which will make it more resilient. And here, I must say, honestly, I have my doubts. Um, and the key doubt is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that the savings rate in Greece is really so low that Greece cannot get back on a growth path um, with, which requires some, some investment rates 
uh, without incurring further foreign debt. Even if it is not public debt, if it's private debt, I mean, having a current account deficit, you cannot finance, and Christoph has shown that, uh, you cannot finance your growth for 20 years relying only on foreign capital. I repeat, even if it's private, because then the returns anyway have to go, go abroad. And that for me is a key element uh, when I look at the long-term prospect. Now, uh, for the next three years, Greece will get even more transfers from the EU. And uh, that provides a little boost. But I very much doubt that this is a boost which will last for the next 10 years. It gives you a bit more capital, a higher base, but it doesn't give you a more trajectory, a different growth rate. And finally, and uh, this is again something which we know from history, if you have a large influx of capital from abroad uh, also has a Dutch disease effect. Right? It makes the, exempt, the, the resumption of export-led growth more difficult. Moreover, if it all goes through the hands of the government, it becomes even more important that you have a clean administration government. And uh, of course, we have now a different government, but is the entire administration has already been reformed? That's the question mark I would put. Uh, Will the, uh, will the funds which come from the EU have counterproductive effects on export growth? Um, and will they actually mean that the country then changes towards a model which is based much more on domestic savings and higher export growth? For the time being, the, the funds from abroad go in the opposite, dire in the opposite direction. And that is the concern which I have. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, we're coming to the end of the session. We've overrun a little bit. Um, but I just want to give you all um, the opportunity to follow uh, Daniel in just giving your thoughts about the future um, beyond the short term, so, um, looking at the next four decades, four or five decades. Where is Greece going? Christoph? So I'd like to emphasize the political economy risks, both the domestic ones and the, glo and the broader global ones. Um, I think the, you know, it's nice to have low interest rates, but it's also tempting for politicians. Uh, and uh, the question is, if uh, interest rates would turn uh, towards the end, uh, what happens then? Uh, so I, 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 if there is a risk that the current situation tempts politicians to fall back in old habits, and that's true for all politicians, not just Greek ones, Greek ones. And the question is whether the political system, and this is the big question, domestically reforms, advances, so the advances we've seen with regard to the statistical, level, whether that would happen in more segments of the political um, universe uh, in Greece. So that that is, you know. The best hope is that this will happen, that Greece will follow the Asian example and, and do domestic reforms that make it more uh, robust, more resilient for the challenges of globalization. And the second is the global and European political economy. So yes, I agree with Daniel, because we are, the debt is in safe hands, but we're talking about debt for the majority of 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, I really hope that the European project will advance um, and I will do much to, you know, contribute to that. But who knows what will happen in 20 to 30 years. We are living in a very tumultuous world. Uh, it's becoming bipolar um, or multipolar. Um, so I, I do see a risk that the close con European connection, the, the whole geopolitical situation, um, might complicate the, the issues with Greeks' current debt more than we think at the current stage. So uh, if uh, what Will the ESM exist in 2023? Right. So there is a there's a it's a tail risk. Hopefully, it's a small tail risk, but there is a risk. I'd like to point to that. Thanks very much, Christoph. So, um, very brief and final remarks from um, Costas. First of all, 
Uh, thank you, John. Um, I bet a lot on growth, and I bet a lot on uh, the new growth model of the, of the country. I cannot guarantee that this is going to happen, but I bet a lot. Right? Um, I guess uh, I agree with Daniel that um, the inflow of uh, external funding uh, through the Recovery and Resilience Fund will have a multiplier effect. But I also see that as a, as a funding that will change the structure of the economy and help the business community and the institutions to move towards an export rate growth. So help the economy to go in this kind of trajectory. And that's the major challenge. It's not easy, right? Because we are changing the structure of the economy and this takes years. A lot of innovation and a lot of um, innovative design and forward-looking design. But this is the, uh, the major challenge for the country, to move towards an open, um, outward-looking economy. And I think that this will make uh, the, the debt sustainable as well. Thank you very much. So final word to you, Paniotis. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, I think uh, for the future, we have three main challenges in the Greek uh, economy. One is the demographic challenge. The second one is the productive and the final one is the institutional. A common denominator of, in all these three ch uh, challenges is, uh, is, it has to do with reforms. Uh, we are lucky that, that because we, at this time we have a pro-reform government. Of course, we have this, uh, this pandemic, but uh, the, the government has uh, showed that it is uh, a pro-reform government. So uh, if we uh, take these challenges into account, and uh, if, if we consider that uh, at the same time we have a tool, uh, which is the Resilience Fund, uh, which finances, uh, gives us uh, a lot of uh, capital. Of course, this is not a, a panacea. Uh, what is needed, and we have this, we also need a plan. And it is the uh, report of Pisaridis uh, um, plan. Uh, we have, so we are in a lucky situation uh, at this time that we have the tool uh, to finance investments. We have the plan to change the, the economy, to change the productive uh, base, uh, to implement uh, changes also in, in, in our state and, uh, and the institutions. Uh, so I'm a little bit more optimistic, but I see the, 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 the risks, but I, 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 remain, I remain optimistic because of this uh, lucky, let's say, uh, moment that we are uh, after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. So we're ending on a, on a positive note uh, there, but I want to thank all of you for giving us a much kind of deeper and historical appreciation of the problem, the problems of um, Greece's public debt and growth challenges. Uh, I think that's really added to the discussions that we've had so far today and it's a really good basis for the discussions that we're going to have this afternoon. Uh, we have to end it now but thanks very much for joining us today, really appreciate it. Uh, I hope we can all meet in person soon, preferably in Greece and um, we're going to head now for a 10 minute break. Thanks again everybody. Thank you.
Welcome back everyone to this Economist virtual event marking the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution of 1821. My name is Joan Hoey. I'm the Director for Europe at the Economist Intelligence Unit in London. For this session, I'm delighted to be joined by George Papandreou, President of the Socialist International and a former Prime Minister of Greece, whose term in office coincided with the start of the Greek sovereign debt crisis in 2009. For the next 15 minutes or so, Mr. Papandreou and I will have a conversation about the Greek crisis and the lessons learned and about the prospects for Greece over the next decade. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Papandreou, for being part of our deliberations today. Welcome. Thank you, Joanne. It's um, great to be with you. And uh, I was able to follow some of the discussions very rich in, um, in dealing with the history and also the crisis uh, that Greece has recently gone through. Fantastic. Um, may I ask, um, to start with, ask you, what were the failings that led Greece into the disaster that unfolded from 2009 onwards? How do you see those failings? I see three failings. Uh, one, of course, had to do with Greece. The other one had to do with uh, the European Union and particularly with the Eurozone. And the third was uh, a failing of global capitalism or global finance, if you like, which, of course, had started with the Lehman's brother uh, affair, the subprime uh, issue, which created a global, a global uh, problem. And Greece was caught up in this uh, as a weak link at, at a point where um, we actually uh, dealing with this issue could, uh, could affect the global, the global uh, economy. Now, if I want to talk, let's talk about the Greek uh, particularly failures. Uh, and the, the historical perspective is, uh, has been discussed this morning. We've had multiple debts, uh, debt crises, uh, and there's a combination of external dependency, uh, and I would also add internal dependency. External dependency on foreign powers, which either helped or used their power to influence Greece and, and keep Greece dependent uh, on certain, uh, for their geopolitical reasons. Uh, with with quite a bit of sometimes positive, but also very detrimental uh, um, effects on Greece. But the internal dependency, I would say, has to do with the what was discussed this morning also, the uh, fact that the Greek state basically was built up on clientelistic interests, uh, groups of, 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 of uh, antagonistic uh, powers, or if you like, societal groups. Uh, and this created a structure um, of dependency of the Greek people. Uh, what the clientelism, in, in, in fact, uh, would, would mean, uh, we can talk about it a lot, it's something that exists around in many parts of the world, and in the periphery particularly, is the lack of strong institutions, democratic institutions, which will keep power in check democratically. And that is what we have seen. We have seen the arbitrary use of power uh, people, uh, con uh, com parties coming into power, uh, using that power to, to distribute spoils uh, of the winner rather than really investing in um, the public good, if you like. That happened particularly five years previous to my government. Uh, I'm not trying to be political here, but this is, the, this is how I see it, the facts. And just to give you one example of uh, how our institutions were not working. We had a statistical office that was under the influence of pol the political desires of the government. So we ended up giving false statistics to the European Union and undermining the basic trust, both in the European Union, globally and in the markets. Actually, it's a scandal. It's one of the major scandals. Uh, we brought in an independent, we created an independent statistical uh, a service agency, completely independent, brought in a high quali highly qualified person called Andreas Yeriu. He is still being persecuted in Greece, uh, politically, uh, through, through, through justice also, which shows how politicized sometimes justice is too, for what he did. Uh, all our, all our, uh, our bailouts, uh, all our budgets since then have been based on his statistics. They have been 
the first time Greek statistics are completely transparent, yet he is still being persecuted. And this shows that we are still not living up to the reckoning, a national reckoning of what the crisis was about. And I believe the crisis was about, uh, I'm not talking about one or another party, but the, certainly it was about the lack of the institutional capacity to really create a, a modern and democratic state. Of course, we've made huge leaps and bounds, and Greece has done many, many positive things over the last 200 years, and we've had uh, great epics of heroism and, 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 and fighting for our, for, for, for our liberation, but our internal, our internal structures need deep reforms. That brings me to the European Union. The European Union uh, felt that, uh, well, first of all, there was a sense of we have to punish this, these uh, lazy Greeks. Actually, we work more hours than uh, any other European Union country, uh, according to OECD. But it was also uh, a, a lack of understanding that we needed deep reform rather than simply budgetary cuts. The, they put too much emphasis on austerity, uh, and that was not even the, the, the right solution for the global crisis that existed. Uh, Europe did not do what the US or China did, investing then to, uh, to really get out of the recession. But it was really hard on Greece. And of course, it was very easy to say Greece was the problem and not the European Union structures, particularly the Eurozone structures with the fiscal policies necessary and the way to immediately calm the markets, which did come later on. And actually 10 years later, in dealing with the pandemic and the recession that the pandemic has created, Europe has learned. We've created a sense of a euro bond and, and, and uh, there's, there's much more massive uh, investment, uh, much more money going into our economies. Uh, this would have been, of course, uh, been able to have really helped Greece in moving towards reforms. Finally, there was this global crisis. And of course, we had the scandal of the subprime uh, people of financial banks uh, selling off bonds, which were uh, not AAA, they were junk bonds, people buying them, uh, uh, creating, of course, a huge crisis around the world. And, and of course, we also have the huge power of finance and, and global corporations. Uh, for example, we had to raise taxes in Greece to, you know, deal with our budget deficit, uh, but at the same time, the financial system was helping people move money away or hide money, particularly the richer parts uh, of our society. And uh, this has become a global problem. Tax evasion, tax competition, tax havens. Uh, I fought at that point for measures at the European level to, to, to change this or to, to, to mitigate this uh, at the global level, such as, such as the financial transaction tax. It looks like something might happen. I see that um, the new head of the Fed in, in the U.S., Mrs. Yellen, just called for a global tax to deal with this exact problem. So this was a global issue. So Greece was in the center, if you like, of a, not only its own, but also a European and a global uh, crisis. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. So let's um, maybe unpick a few of the things. Um, uh, like everything we've discussed today, we have layers of complexity um, uh, that, and, and, and we can unpick these things a bit further maybe. So I think there has been a lot of agreement today among our speakers that Greece has suffered from a systemic problem um, with deep historical structural roots, this problem of clientelism and a kind of patronage, political patronage system that you talked about um, uh, with a particular focus on the period leading up to, to your government. Obviously, that doesn't absolve Greece's political parties to say that the problem is, is, is structural. Um, and, you know, we need to talk about both parties, the systemic parties, PASOK and, and New Democracy. Why was it after 1974 that neither of these parties set out to reform and eliminate this system of clientelism? Um, instead, this political patronage was used to um, you know, boost um, the public sector. I think by 2008, one million people were employed in the public sector in Greece. That's about 22 point 
5% of the um, of the workforce, and that's according to an OECD report. So it was also a failing of political parties, um, your own included, um, to address that problem. So what was the what was stopping that from happening? Well, I will I will have a slightly different interpretation. We were, of course, uh, two thousand year, two hundred years. Sorry, two hundred years. We do have our two thousand year history, of course, but two hundred years of of, of clientelistic policies. Uh, we've all been smitten by this idea of this this way of, of politics. However, I would disagree that our party did not fight against it. Actually, we are the only party, and I'm I'm not. Um, uh, it may sound may, may, may overstating, but I believe we are the only party in the modern uh, history after the junta in '74 that actually had antibodies towards clientelism. Yes, we also got caught up in clientelistic policies, but we brought in reforms that were fighting against clientelism. I'll give you one simple one, meritocracy and getting into, into the public service. Up till mid eighties, basically uh, everybody could come and say, I want, a, I want a position, I want a job in the public service, and they would get it through political means. If you had political, uh, uh, somebody who had, contacts with the, with the government or with some poli strong politician, and that's how it worked. Uh, even driver's license in the past were an issue of, you know, you have to go to the, your local politician to make sure that he gives you the, you know, a signature that you can go get your driver's license. So this is the type of clientelism was there. That's changed. We brought in constitutional changes. We brought in uh, transparency when I was in, in government. I brought in uh, transparency so that we made sure everybody knew where the money was going. Uh, everything's on the internet. No, uh, no expenditure can be made by public service services without it being on the internet. So we fought against this. We brought in a number of institutions to do this. But I will say there are strong interests that do not want this. And I'm not talking not only in political parties, but outside political parties. We have our oligarchs, if you like, or our different groups, they don't want a system which is efficient and, and which, is, which, is, which is just and which is transparent. Um, they would like to just do dealings uh, with, with government, whether it's in the banking sector, whether it's in the industrial sector, whether it's in procurement, whether it's in um, media. And I think this is one of the major problems. And one of the major problems I had, because as I fought, in the short two years I was prime minister against this, they were one of the strongest oppositions to what I was doing. Uh, and of course, if you add that to the underst understandable pain that the Greek people were going through, it was quite easy to develop uh, um, an opposition to this. However, we did go through, we did pass many, many reforms at the time, but there's much more that needs to be done, Joanne, uh, if we want to really make this country a modern, democratic, institutionally well-functioning and efficient and transparent and accountable state and governance. So governance, mm -hmm. governance I would say, is the big issue now in, in, in um, and, I, and I'm sorry that this is a narrative that sometimes is not being, uh, not being tackled because it does go back, we have to, we have, to have a reckoning about well, why, why it happened. Not to blame each other, but you know, put history to rest and say, okay, let's make the changes. Let's fight this clientelistic way of thinking and, and move forward. And it's, and, and let me put it Thanks. this way. We're going to... in, it, it, yeah, go ahead. I will, I will con continue at another question. Yeah, we're, we're going to finish our conversation talking more about the future, but I think we should spend maybe a few minutes about those talking about those two years. So when you came into office within weeks and months, you were confronted with the magnitude of the problem that had built up of the Greek public finances and public debt. Um, so my questions about that period are twofold. Um, do you think that your government, that you acted decisively to address the problem? and what could have been done differently? So both by your government and also um, by outsiders. We've all, you've already talked a little bit uh, about that. So how quickly did you come to the view that 
a debt restructuring was necessary. Um, was the problem on the Greek side not acting decisively enough, or what, was it the problem of the European institutions? Did they delay too long, causing the crisis to escalate? And then the solution that they proposed, as you suggested, was too extreme. You know, the austerity program that was put in place made matters worse. Yes, well, we had. So it's too. Uh, I understood. We had. We had very quickly. Uh, when when this deficit was revealed, uh, which we could do, we could not hide it, and I would not have hidden it. And the reason I would have not have hidden it is that I wanted reform, and we needed to show that this this cannot continue. We reached a deficit of fifteen point six percent. It was a huge deficit, and but we had lost the trust of the markets because of. First of all, hiding the deficit, but also giving false statistics, the previous government, to the European Union. And also that the fact that it was taking time to really figure out what the deficit was. So we were, the markets were going wild. Europe responded saying, this is a Greek problem. And of course, it's very convenient for leaders to say it's a Greek problem because they really don't have to do much. They just say, okay, you, you have to deal with it. I was saying all the time, it, yes, we have our problem, but it is also a European problem. Because if you do not support the reforms in Greece by calming the markets, we won't be able to get loans, we won't be able to invest, we, won't, we will be, uh, we will be um, people will start talking about Grexit, which they did, and that, of course, completely paralyzed the economy. So it made recovery and, and the whole um, you know, reform much more difficult. Finally, in, in 2012, Draghi comes in and he says something very clear. He says, I see the speculation in the markets. I see the fears in the markets. I'm not going to let that happen. I myself am going to do whatever it takes, which could mean buying up bonds and so on. And we see also today that Europe is much more robust in dealing with these types of questions. What it did show is that if Europe does work together, we are stronger. Not everybody believes that. I mean, Brexiteers didn't believe that. Uh, but even Germany at the time did not want to take up risk. But I feel if we pool our risk, we'll be much stronger. Uh, finally, of course, I fought and we did have a bailout program. I didn't want to ask for money. I did not want money from the outside. I wanted access to the markets. Had Draghi been in earlier, had Trichet said that something like this earlier, possibly would have continued to do to access the markets. And we already, before we even asked for money, we had the most um, biggest cuts that any OECD country has ever done. OECD came out and said this. Greece in 2010 had the biggest budgetary cuts that any other country has done. We had more, I think it was 5% or so uh, 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 cutting, uh, cutting in one year. And they also said that Greece was number one amongst OECD countries in reforms. So we did what we, we should have done. I think Europe was doing things too late and too little. And uh, I, I'm talking to, I think, had Europe listened to the United States, which had much more experience in dealing with similar problems in Latin America and Asia, the US was saying, listen, forget about this moralistic punishment, deal with the problem, you know, help Greece, do help it also do its reforms and then we'll we'll talk about you know who was right and who was wrong and, and what the responsibilities are we didn't follow and i'm not barack obama at the time and i talked to him often and he written in his recent book really pushed this in the european on the european union but there was this very narrow um, sense of okay just austerity and if we do austerity and we cut the budget markets will be fine but in the end, this was not the only way to deal with it. Greece alone could not have dealt with the problem. We had to deal with it at the European level. So too little, too late from the European side. Um, and why was that, do you think? Was that mainly because of the political situation, the political, domestic political obstacles uh, for Angela Merkel, for example, in, in, in Germany at the time? Was that the, really the problem? 
Yes, I believe that uh, in Germany there was um, a reticence, uh, a fear. Uh, there was a bad image that Greece had that had been created in the public public also about Greece. Um, and even though I was there as a reformer, people just were saying uh, Greece cannot be trusted. So that's one of the problems. But Merkel had her internal problems. Uh, I understand them. However, I do believe that uh, had she been much more dynamic and decisive towards the markets at that time, at the initial stage, and said, listen, Europe is going to back Greece. Um, don't worry, you're, you're not, you're not going to lose your money. Or had she had decided, or we all decided for an immediate haircut, there were two ways of dealing with this, and economists had different views. One is that Europe takes up all of the debt of Greece, and we pay back over a longer period, which is partially what we have come up to as a solution. And the other one was, of course, the haircut. Uh, which is also what we did. We had the biggest haircut under my watch uh, ever in, in, in global history, in recent global history. Had we had either the haircut initially or the backing of the European Union in, in, in the beginning, beginning stages towards the markets, I believe even Europe would not have had to pay so much. And I told Angela Merkel this. I said, listen, I'm not asking for your money. I'm asking for your support in the markets. That will cost you much less because in the end, you may have to pay which actually happened. Although in the end, I mean, these are loans, so we are paying them back um, and with interest and with oh. high interest initially. Yeah, so, so Europe, maybe this- uh, so Europe has learned after 10 years, after up. 10 years, Europe has learned. And I think what others have said in, in the previous uh, previous discussions, the, the Eurozone did not have the tools uh, and the, uh, and the structures to deal with these types of issues. Uh, now we're talking a little bit more about um, common fiscal policy. The ESM might become a European monetary fund. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, common investment or common borrowing, which are already doing that now for the pandemic. Uh, I think that if we really want to see this in the future, we have to create these structures if Europe wants to be strong, financially, economically, growth-wise, particularly now if we want to transit into a more sustainable and green economy. We do need investment. It's a time when interest rates are still low. It's, 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 we shouldn't use this, lose this opportunity. Thanks. Um, just to finish very briefly, because um, we're running into the next session, um, I wanted to ask you, are you confident uh, then about the future? Are you confident that Greece can outgrow its debt problem or will a new generation um, of Greek youth still be paying the price uh, for this crisis 20, 30 years from now? I am. I think we have great capacity, and one of the, our capacities is we have a younger generation which is highly educated. And luckily, many of them, maybe over five hundred thousand, have left Greece in the recent years, and that's one of our major problems. But they're also a hope. But to make that young generation a catalyst for change, we have to learn from this crisis ten years ago that we should have worked together as parties, much more national unity or national consensus, too easy to scapegoat, whether they externally or talking about the memoranda, but not talking about the deeper reasons why we, we reached this and talking about the clientelism or the, the, the idea of clientelism and now, and, and then the sort of mentality of clientelism. And my worry is that there's going to be a lot of money coming into Greece. There is a lot of money. It's the, uh, uh, rejuvenation and resilience program, uh, the next generation uh, program from the European Union. I do not want to see this money used in a narrow clientelistic way. What I would see is that this is a, a great opportunity to open up a huge debate in our society. What kind of Greece do we want? Where are we going to invest? We're going to talk about green development. Greece could be number one maybe if not in the world, certainly in Europe, in green energy, geothermal, wind, sun, we could have best biological 
prod products in our in our food. We could develop wellness tourism with education and health linked to this. We have great young people in high tech and in, in, in new technologies. So my criticism of this government is don't push through a program which is simply uh, done behind closed doors. Bring in Greek society, bring in the parties, make it an ownership and mobilize Greek society for the necessary changes. And as I said, one of the basic changes is not simply changing the uh, whole productive forces in Greece, but creating the institutions which will bring trust, participation, and efficiency, uh, transparency, accountability, deepening democracy. George Papandreou, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us today. It was great to hear yeah, from you, you and to hear much. your thoughts. Thank you. We'll now have a three-minute break, and the next session I'll be handing over to our moderator, John Papayogiu. Um, so after three minutes, welcome back, everybody. Thanks again, George Papandreou. Thank you. Perfection is found in the simplest of things, in the love shared by a young family enjoying their day, in healthy organic foods free of impurities, and even in a single drop of water. But over the years, water has become imperfect. Farming, mass production and fertilizers have polluted our drinking water with toxic nitrates. There isn't a single source of spring water on Earth that can actually say it's completely pure, except one. In Romania, along the Carpathian Mountains, is the largest untouched forest in Europe. 60,000 square miles of wild forest safeguard the original purity of massive rainfall. It's a place where thick, fragrant pines, firs and spruces stand majestically over a verdant undergrowth, guarding against the influence of man. A protected region still populated by countless deers and the largest European population of brown bears, lynxes and wolves. Here, deep in the wilderness, is the source for the purest, most perfect water in the world, Aqua Carpatica. A water that has taken a 40-year underground journey through layers of neogen volcanic rock and dolomite, which filters the water of impurities and enriches it with natural bicarbonates of calcium, magnesium and potassium. Thanks to the existence of extinct underground volcanoes, naturally occurring carbon dioxide dissolves through faults into the aquifer and the water becomes naturally sparkling. A water that poses a smooth and pleasant taste, perfectly balanced and naturally nitrate free. Experience water love. Aqua Carpatica, the water that loves you back. Visit us today and learn more. Aquacarpatica.co.uk Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's great having you with us, and it's a great honor being with you. Uh, I would like to thank The Economist for its kind invitation to moderate especially this interesting panel. I'm John Papayorgiou, and it seems that the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution, or the 200 years of Greece's economic survival, finds us uh, in a post-bailout era. Uh, the debt, but, only, but not only debt, uh, crisis uh, finds us finds Greece in uh, the framework of uh, the enhanced surveillance program, the EU uh, enhanced surveillance uh, framework, and uh, under the post-program monitoring uh, according to the IMF framework. Our distinguished speakers uh, were involved in uh, all recent Greek bailout programs, and it's a great opportunity to listen to them and see at which level. Uh, these programs uh, worked, how effective they were, what lessons are learned or should be learned in order to avoid uh, such crises in the short but in the long term future as well. It's an honor, it's an honor having with us uh, Mr. Paul Thompson, the former director of uh, the European Department at the IMF, Mr. Thomas Wieser, the former president of the Euro Working Group. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. 
And uh, of course, there is a lot of talk and allow me to say a lot of speculation about the 2009-2019 decade. So before any questions, before my questions or the questions we may have online, I would like, to, I would like you to share with us, um, first of all, where we stand, your uh, conclusions after these programs, and uh, if possible, any high, highlights from your personal involvement. Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation, and hello to everybody, hello, Thomas. Uh, so I think this is a very timely debate. Uh, 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 what can we learn from how we dealt with the Greek crisis? Because I personally think that we are at the risk of repeating some of the mistakes that we did uh, back in uh, dealing with the, with the uh, Greek crisis. And let me say in this regard, I certainly look at the situation quite different from I, I did in 2010. Let me make four brief points, uh, uh, four brief succinct points. The first one is that I am quite pessimistic about Greece's ability to prosper within the Eurozone. I'm here looking at you know, 10, 20 years, what happened beyond that, I don't know. And my, my views are very much rooted in what we have heard today, the clientelism of, 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 of uh, the system, and uh, Mr. Papandreou just brought it out very, uh, very uh, clearly. The decision to admit Greece to the Euro was clearly a political one that had no basis in economic realities. It was based on this notion that if you put a country in a straitjacket, politician would be forced to adopt the necessary reforms. That has proven naive. It has not happened. It didn't happen before the crisis, not happened since. Greece was forced in 2012 by the Europeans and the IMF to adopt some pretty important uh, labor market reforms. And in 2015, to some pension and tax reforms that would have made the fiscal policy much more growth friendly. But these reforms were neither either not implemented or later uh, uh, reversed. So I, I uh, and you, you might say that the current government is doing things. Yes, I know it's sort of picking up on privatization, some digitalization, but this is really tinkering on the margins compared to what really needs to be done in a world where everybody else is doing a structural reform. I don't see Greece closing gaps. I see it will st struggle to prevent that its young people will continue to leave Greece in large numbers to seek a better life uh, abroad, all because of the clientelism that we, uh, that we have discussed this morning. This leads me to my second point. The 2010 program was clearly much too optimistic in its assumptions about economic growth because of my first point. Uh, uh, this meant also we were far too optimistic about Greece's debt servicing capacity. This does not mean, I would stress, that we should have insisted on a debt restructuring in May 2010. I still think, given the lack of a firewall, a crisis resolution mechanism, we had no other choice than bailing out creditors at the time. But I think we, certainly the IMF at that time, with the benefit of hindsight, should have insisted with the Europeans, with Germany, that once these fire fire, uh, no, uh, firewalls are in place, there will be a debt structuring. Uh, we didn't do that. And what really happened with, with the bailout of creditors ended up in, in, in what should have been a fairly straightforward technical issue of debt restructuring, ended up becoming a hopelessly politicized by being sort of this north-south focal point with all the sensitivities of our transfer uh, uh, union. And uh, I, I think that that was, in retrospect, a, a, a serious uh, uh, mistake. My third point is on debt sustainability analysis. Uh, uh, they are not only wrong, they are also irrelevant. Uh, uh, and here I'm talking both about what the IMF is doing and what European institutions are, are doing. European institutions attempt to justify the high debt by providing debt sustainability analysis that goes off far into the future and shows that uh, you know, over the very, 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 very long run, at some day in the future, debt can become uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, 
they are based on, on gross assumptions that are not consistent with the political realities uh, uh, regarding reforms. But more important, of course, any solvency problem, any solvency problem will can be shown to be a liquidity problem if you are if you allow projection period for several decades or uh, many decades. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's that's not credible. That's not a credible projections, and creditors would of course not consider it credible. They would know that the country will be a sitting duck for decades waiting for the next, while debt is slowly, slowly going down, waiting for the next crisis to blow it off course. But in the euro area, creditors has been willing to accept it. Why? Because they know they will be bailed out. It's, uh, and, and, and this, this brings me to the, to the, what I think is the overarching conclusion from, from the euro crisis. The euro crisis has not created any meaningful progress towards a political union. But, and certainly not as far as reforms and fiscal is concerned, one can argue with the SSM and the financial sector there have been some progress. But on fiscal policy and reforms, the things that matter for real convergence, we are not anywhere closer to a political union. But what the euro crisis did, true to the bailouts, the Troika bailouts, and in particular the ECB's promise to do whatever it takes it means that the creditors are just not interested in debt levels as long as they can be persuaded that they will be bailed out. I have gone to endless uh, investor conferences in Greece, in Italy and others where investors are not really interested in, 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 in the local policies but in whether Europe is going to bail out whatever uh, 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 happens. So I, uh, uh, in, in, uh, no. I, I, I think all these debt sustainability analysis uh, 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 are, are, are largely irrelevant. And we certainly in the IMF failed to understand that by providing debt sustainability analysis that did not take into account that this is a, is a currency union where you know, uh, other, other countries are, are supportive. Uh, uh, but the Europeans, on the other hand, sort of have these projections that shows that one day we will, we will get there over the very, very uh, uh, long run. The critical issue here is, of course, that while we have these bailouts, we have nothing to ensure that the countries use these bailouts as a breathing space to do the right thing. And we have, we have a moral hazard problem. And let me give you one observation, which is actually quite spectacular if you think about it. All Europe's high debt countries entered the COVID crisis with debt levels at or above the already elevated levels with which they had exited the euro crisis. Despite the fact that they, they had a huge increase in debt, they did nothing to bring it down in the anticipation that they would be bailed out. And they were right. They were bailed out. I'm not saying one should not have done what one did recently under the COVID uh, uh, crisis. There's a strong humanitarian case for that, but we should not fool ourselves. It is a bailout. It's a bailout in a situation where Europe does not have a mechanism for ensuring that the countries do the right thing. And uh, uh, we, should, we should certainly expect the need for more bailouts down the road. My fourth and last point is, uh, uh, is, is very related to this. Uh, uh, this COVID crisis will, despite the mutualization and grants coming from the European Recovery Fund, in, entail a huge increase in indebt indebtedness of, of countries and increased debt levels of the already indebted countries to very, very high level. There will be pressures for more austerity down the road. There are significant pressures for austerity. Of course, this is politically unsustainable. And of course, there will be strong tensions, north-south tensions, and pressures for debt restructuring and bailouts. This time around, it's not happening through the uh, uh, ESM, which is too small, but through the, through the European Central Bank, which, is, which means that I, I cannot see how the European Central Bank can avoid to be severely politicized in the future, the way we are handling 
this crisis. I, of course, understand why here in the midst of the crisis, policymakers would not want to insist on a debt restructuring of the highly indebted countries. But let's not fool ourselves. Once we are over the crisis, there will be a need for this debt to be written off. And of course, we're already seeing pressures from Italy for the ECB to write off uh, the papers that it's buying on its asset purchase uh, program. One way or the other, there will be a need for, for, debt, for debt restructuring. And there will be, it will be very noisy, very, pol very political, uh, uh, but this COVID crisis will dramatically increase North-South tensions down the road. I'll stop here. But uh, first, I will have to pass the floor to Mr. Thomas Wieser, the former president of the Eurowork at the Euroworking Group. And uh, Mr. Wieser, already Paul Thompson has set an agenda. But first of all, I would like to have your approach. So thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, greetings to Athens and wherever Paul is sit sitting um, and others. And uh, I, I just was able to catch uh, the former Prime Minister Papandreou's uh, contribution today. Uh, and uh, I think very, very much of what I would have initially said uh, was said by him about clientelism, etc., etc. And uh, I still distinctly remember the day uh, when uh, George Papa Constantino uh, entered the Eurogroup uh, meeting room and essentially said, uh, Brussels, uh, we've got uh, a problem. And the conclusions uh, that other finance ministers drew um, were uh, that the main problem or the only problem uh, was fiscal. And of course, the more uh, that we delved uh, into, into, the, into the underlying issues, uh, the clearer it uh, became to me and um, quite, quite a number of others that the fiscal side was merely a surface uh, phenomenon uh, of totally different uh, and uh, very severe underlying uh, imbalances uh, and uh, problems. But as I said, uh, the situation that very many actors uh, to believe that the only problem uh, was fiscal. And this had consequences for the programs um, and also for policy uh, developments at the, at the European level. And uh, even though many of us realized it at the time, I think by now very many uh, are cognizant of the fact uh, that we uh, in Europe collectively, more or less collectively, stumbled into the situation lacking understanding and instruments and the political ability to solve uh, the situation. That also, uh, again, reflected on the design of the first uh, program. Uh, and these instruments and understandings and politics, they evolved over time, but not, not very rapidly. And uh, that, in a way, uh, also uh, led to the fact uh, that the IMF was involved and how the IMF um, uh, was involved. And there was quite a discussion at the time amongst uh, European politicians uh, on whether the fund should be in or the fund should be out. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, I uh, remember at one occasion uh, Wolfgang Schäuble saying to Jens Weidmann, who at the time uh, was the advisor of the economic policy advisor of Angela Merkel. Wolfgang Schäuble turned to uh, Jens Weidmann and said, well, if you honestly remember how the discussion went at the time, you will recall how very much against the involvement of the IMF I was and how much I, Wolfgang Schäuble, was insisting uh, that we in Europe had to deal with this issue all by ourselves. But you, Jens, uh, you, Mr. Weidmann, I think he called him, uh, you uh, successfully persuaded uh, the chancellor uh, that the fund should be uh, involved. At the same time over there in Washington, uh, 
uh, the managing director, the then managing director of the fund, and uh, quite a number of staff uh, were all gung ho to be involved uh, in these issues uh, because it came upon uh, a period of the era uh, where the fund uh, was uh, laying off people en masse, uh, uh, thinking many outside commentators uh, and member states uh, reflecting uh, that in the Goldilocks uh, economy uh, of the times, uh, the fund as such in this structure, uh, uh, etc., uh, was not necessarily necessary uh, any longer. So, uh, as, as we know, uh, there was hardly anybody in Europe who knew how to put together uh, such an adjustment program. Uh, program. Um, and we've seen a couple of reasons why uh, the issue of debt sustainability was not uh, solved uh, in a more decisive manner and more uh, upfront. And if, if I think what was the largest mistake uh, we made in uh, between 29 and uh, 2018, uh, it is the debt sustainability issue. As others have said before me, uh, the times uh, for a haircut in 2010 uh, were uh, absolutely not appropriate, uh, but one could have dealt with it uh, in a different manner. But what we need to remember is uh, the whole setting up of the euro area was built on the totally mistaken understanding that there could be no current account crisis, no hardly any meaningful uh, uh, imbalances between member states because money was fungible, we had one central bank, uh, and as such, entering uh, MU, uh, the euro area of the European Union had done away uh, with uh, the so-called balance of payment uh, mechanism, which is a uh, which was and is a fund uh, to uh, uh, to fund uh, such adjustment programs. Given the enormity of the Greek problem, it would have been uh, pitifully uh, too weak. But uh, again, I want to emphasize there was a complete lack of understanding of what the issues were. Uh, and not only amongst uh, prime ministers and finance ministers, uh, but well down uh, into many chancelleries and finance ministries uh, and even uh, uh, central banks. Given this lack of understanding, uh, there was also a total lack uh, of instruments. And if you don't understand what the issue is, then you don't start building an instrument uh, to solve uh, the problem that you don't understand. We collectively, Europe collectively learned uh, the hard way, and we do now have uh, the European stability mechanism. We have since people uh, painfully uh, were made aware of uh, the doom loops between sovereigns and banks and banks and sovereigns. Uh, we partially uh, solved the problem by setting up the single supervisory uh, mechanism and a couple of other issues. Uh, but were we able, did we want to, and were we able to solve the huge structural underlying issues uh, that not only the Greek economy, but the Greek society uh, was uh, uh, facing. And uh, I'm not as uh, pessimistic uh, as Paul. We have to keep our respective uh, attitudes uh, there. Uh, but I, I would say there were attempts, uh, uh, significant attempts in the program to solve these distributional issues. And uh, I think as soon as one does a post-mortem on a program, I remember the post-mortems on IMF programs uh, uh, in Asia, and says, oh my God, uh, we've, we've made this huge mistake. We were much too invasive. We were much too granular. We should have uh, 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 tried to define what should the outcome be and not prescribe minutely uh, the liberalization of taxi services and pharmaceutical uh, 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 issues and shipping industry between uh, Athens and Crete and Athens and Samos and da -da 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 -da. hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, of actions. But as soon as you're confronted with the reality uh, on the ground, bingo, there you go. Uh, you start, you attempt to liberalize 
pharmacies, taxis, this, that, and the other, not uh, by saying to the Greek government, uh, you will get an adjustment loan if you liberalize your economy and get rid of clientelism. Uh, for some reason, it never uh, works that way. And again and again, I was approached uh, by Greek friends who said, oh, uh, the program is not intrusive enough. You have to change our educational system. You've got to change our justice system. You've uh, got to make sure that uh, the police can enter universities again. You have to make sure that this doesn't happen, this happens, and this doesn't happen. I say, guys, we're already under fire because we're much too invasive and intrusive into, Greek, into the Greek economy and the Greek society. Uh, this is an issue that ultimately, in the interest of sovereign self-respect and in the interest of the representativeness of democratic institutions and elections, the Greek society has to want and implement. And if you don't, you don't. But don't want us, the institutions, and the other member states to be so invasive that the last vestiges uh, of government disappear. It can't work. So this, in a way, encapsulates, for me, uh, the huge dilemma that one faces with all programs and with programs within the euro area uh, very specifically. Maybe a couple of uh, conclusions there. One, uh, the role of the European institutions. Some, a bunch of geniuses in 1944 uh, set up the Bretton Woods institutions and created the IMF uh, as uh, an institution uh, which had more or less one mission in life. Uh, it was financed with one or two exceptions with central bank money, uh, which uh, is not under the purview uh, of uh, national parliaments. Uh, it is the nasty bogeyman sitting in Washington, and you can be totally pissed off uh, with, with, with the IMF and get on with your other business. The European Commission, on the other hand, is an institution which is the central European institution in dealing with member states. And out of the 189 issues uh, that the Commission has on its plate with the certain member states, for 188, it needs an amicable, uh, uh, not antagonistic way of collaboration then you expect the Commission to behave as the IMF does, as being intrusive and ordering a member state to do something. It doesn't work. So asking the Commission uh, to do anything similar to the IMF uh, was a uh, failure right from the beginning, and I'm not quite sure if the ESM, as it is set up uh, under finance ministries and financed uh, by government, uh, is yet fully fit uh, to take, take over this uh, role. Secondly, uh, within a monetary union, uh, you give up a huge amount of sovereignty, uh, and it is well known to prime ministers, finance ministers, and others that you give up monetary uh, autonomy. But few people realize, want to realize, how much of fiscal sovereignty and other sovereignty you give up. That is a dilemma. Uh, how do we run fiscal policy, which on the one hand uh, is under the purview of national sovereign parliaments, but on the other hand is geared in such a manner does it, that it does not create imbalances and instability for the other members of the euro area. And lots of people writing about it should stop dreaming about uh, common, uh, a fiscal union, common fiscal policy in our lifetime, no matter how young we are, you of the three of us on the screen are the youngest, John, but even you uh, will not live uh, to see a fully functional fiscal union. So as Mario Draghi used to say, either you've got institutions, ECB, or you've got rules. But how do you deal, how do you structure the rules that they're intelligent, that are kept to, uh, and uh, are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, that, there, that respect, uh, by and large, both uh, the issue of sovereignty, but solidarity uh, and treating policies as matters of common concern within a monetary union. It is very difficult, and I think we're still quite away, away from there. Uh, I will 
no doubt you will be picking up, John, uh, on Paul's uh, uh, issues about future debt restructuring and the like, so I will refrain from commenting on them. Uh, I will just close uh, for now uh, by saying that uh, in the middle of 2014, I was pretty confident uh, that Greece could be, in a way, on track uh, to having uh, debt relief uh, and uh, exiting the sex program uh, in a fairly decent manner. So for those who think that it was only from 2015 onwards uh, that problems emerged, no, uh, the second half of 2014 uh, made one already extremely pessimistic uh, and uh, showed that the problems were multi-party problems, Greek problems, and not confined to only one government. But in 2015, of course, we came extremely close uh, for the Europe, uh, Europe area, uh, all of a sudden being made up only of 18 and not only 19 member states. And uh, much of that, uh, uh, much of the trouble and grief uh, that Greece uh, went through over the past five, six years can be attributed uh, to happenings in the first half of 2015. So I'll stop uh, for now. Uh, I think Paul and I could go on for seven hours in reminiscing uh, and reflecting on what happened, why and why not. Uh, but we've got uh, uh, time constraints here as well. Thanks very much. Thank you for this, Mr. Vizer. Uh, I will come back to the Euro area upcoming framework, let's say, let's call it like that. Like that. But let me, for, for a bit, stick on the reform agenda. In my opinion, I do not think that I am an, uh, an exception. When, we say, when we, we say reforms, we mean development, we mean change, we mean progress. But that was not the case in Greece. In Ireland, for example, that was uh, pretty much different. So uh, there was, and at some point there is still, uh, there still is a misunderstanding or a lack of ownership. So, uh, first of all, the question is why? And second, uh, and uh, most important, which set, which uh, package of reforms uh, hasn't been implemented and could be a game changer? Mr. Thompson? Yeah, so I, uh, I think uh, uh, there is no sort of silver bullet as far as reforms are concerned. One, one single reforms. It's, uh, it's really a broad modernization of, of, uh, of, of the economy. Uh, uh, it is after some important uh, uh, labor market reforms. And here I, I, wa I want, to, want to say that I fully agree with former Prime Minister Papandreou that they tried. And they were to stand up to their own, to their own uh, political base by doing difficult labor market reforms. New democracy never stood up to its base by opening up the economy, closed professions, and, and as a result, uh, uh, Pasok, of course, paid a terrible uh, price. Uh, so I, I think one, one, one need to give uh, uh, Papa Andreo and, and, and his colleagues, uh, Papa Constantino and others, c uh, credit uh, for that. The reforms did not happen because of the clientelism that we talked about, which you don't see in, in Ireland. In places like Ireland, they, they basically told, told us what they wanted to do, and they, they, uh, uh, they did it. The key issue, I think, in the, side, uh, the public sector is pension reforms. Pension systems are totally unaffordable, uh, and tax reforms. The middle, essentially, Greece gives a sort of northern European type pensions uh, with a southern European type tax system where it doesn't tax the middle class. It's fundamentally unsustainable. The result is it has to compress all other expenditures now uh, to levels that where the state cannot deliver basic uh, uh, public services, services and and compress uh, capital spending, which is bad uh, for economic growth as, as, as well. Uh, but the, the problem is, is rooted in that uh, this clientelism, and I fully, what, what we learned from the Troika, but which the IMF have learned you know, long before that, uh, is that you cannot impose these reforms. 
you cannot impose such structural reforms on its system uh, that that it that it sticks and this is of course comes back to what 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 thomas said and what i said before europe has not developed the means for forcing greece to do it because it's politically uh, you know, just not possible. Uh, this would this 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 would require a transfer of sovereignty that will not happen in our lifetime. But let me also say then, when I hear, for instance, uh, Pap Andrea say, we should pool our risks because we are stronger together. It is it's no northern politician in his right mind would accept to should accept to pool the risk uh, in a country as we have discussed that has 200 years of clientelism. It, so that is the dilemma. It is the dilemma that Europe need to provide the support, but Europe has no meaningful way for ensuring that Greece do the do the right reforms. And that's that's why I am fundamentally pessimistic about the outlook. Mr. Visser, on the reform agenda, and I will come back on the EU and the debt later. Well, as uh more or less as Paul. Um, we had uh, five adjustment programs uh, for uh, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Cyprus. And uh, if we have a sort of spectrum uh, where uh, countries say, this was largely my fault, uh, and uh, where uh, countries say this was largely foreigners' fault, uh, Ireland is the country with the greatest uh, degree of critical introspection. They said, we did things wrong, we'll do them right, uh, we'll change, and there we go. Uh, and Greece is the country uh, most prone to saying it was the foreigners. Uh, and therefore, uh, let's not change uh, too much. And uh, I think that colors very much uh, this question on uh, ownership, uh, uh, for example. Uh, and ultimately, uh, if, if you think uh, of where one would really want to be, where one would love to see Greece, uh, I would just, if, if needed to be short, I would say, as soon as it is a meritocratic uh, society where you uh, have access, equal access to hospital services, uh, no matter uh, where you don't need an envelope, uh, where uh, access uh, to concessions uh, is uh, equal, uh, where a country uh, where you don't uh, have, uh, let's say, uh, ownership structures of industry or shipping and media, uh, which uh, in most other countries uh, would be uh, subject to severe uh, limitations because uh, they push special interest groups uh, and the like, uh, i.e. Uh, get away from nepotism and towards meritocracy. And if you pursue this principle, uh, this deals very much uh, with the quality of public administration, uh, which uh, for me, uh, which started out many, many years ago, not so bad, uh, but then uh, for a variety of reasons went down the hill. Uh, it would uh, solve uh, issues with uh, how, you, how, do you, how you define pension rights, uh, access uh, to uh, social policy payments, uh, etc. cetera. So uh, if it, it does away uh, with favoritism. And uh, if it does away with favoritism, uh, many uh, issues that also Paul mentioned uh, would not uh, be as uh, severe uh, as uh, as they may be. Let me say already now uh, that I don't uh, see uh, the future as bleak uh, as Paul does, uh, but voila, a discute. Looking forward, uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, you told us uh, in the beginning that uh, the presence of Greece in the Euro area back in 2010 was a problem in order to uh, face the, the fiscal and the, uh, the debt uh, crisis back then, the fiscal problems and the debt crisis. Uh, some years later, now, there is a new EU framework. Uh, common debt is going to be issued through the recovery and resilience facility, through the recovery fund. 
And uh, actually, the landscape is a bit different. The, the Greek debt is, let's say, in the family, in the euro area. So uh, the question is what Greece has to do uh, in the short term and uh, which questions have to be answered within the euro area in order to create a new fiscal or financial framework when the pandemic is over, when the general escape clause is removed. Paul? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as, as I said, despite the grants, despite the debt neutralization that's now in the new uh, uh, pandemic recovery program, debt levels will go up dramatically, right? France and Italy uh, will have debt that will get uh, sort of uh, up, up um, significantly above where they are now. Uh, Italy uh, will uh, be up uh, close to uh, Greece's and Greece will be off the charts when it's all over. You know, how much depend on, 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 on the number? There's some uncertainty, but it will go up dramatically. That will entail pressures for austerity. There, you're not going to get uh, the Europeans to say, are oh, we going to continue to bail out and provide future bailouts? Uh, they will want to, to sort of uh, get an understanding that debt comes down through austerity. We know that will not happen, and we know that uh, 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 but the pressures will be, political tensions will be there. And uh, uh, of, of course, uh, it, it will not come down significantly. And when the next crisis comes, Europe will have to bail out again. The fundamental dilemma is, as I said, the moral hazard one that in such a system, there's really no incentives for Greece and other countries uh, to, uh, to deal with their problems. And that's why the Eurozone is fundamentally, dynamically unstable in the absence of a credible move towards political union, where essentially Brussels tells the Greeks when to, when to retire. That's politically not going to happen. I agree with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Thomas at, at that. I think the major, major issue now is we are no longer bailing out through the ESM. It is the ECB that is bailing out. And now the ECB is deviating from its key. Uh, uh, or stand ready to deviate uh, uh, from its key, and creditors are very happy with that. And actually, the ECB doesn't have to deviate much because, as long as it's promised to do so, uh, creditors are uh, uh, very, very happy. But once we get to the point, and I personally think it comes faster than most people think, but that's a personal view. Once we get to the point where ECB will start tightening, this north-south fragmentation will come back with a vengeance because there will be a time where cyclical conditions in the north suggest that there should be a tightening and at that time there will be major problem in southern countries once that tightening uh, comes we're not whether when that's going to happen i don't know one year two years three years i don't know but it's going to come and at that time there's clearly a big risk that the tightening will be laid, fiscal dominance, uh, ECB uh, will be further politicized. Uh, now, southern countries have already put ministers of, former ministers of finance at the EC board and ECB management. So this, this, becomes, this will become a, 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 a significant political issue down the road. The tightening will probably come too late, inflation will go up, but at one stage it will have to come. And at that time, you get dramatic north-south tension uh, and, 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 and uh, pressure, pressure, pressure for, for, for debt reduction. So th that's why I say I think the COVID crisis will, because Europe has not moved meaningful to a political union. On the contrary, instead of catalyzed movement toward a political union, the bailouts and the whatever it takes have actually undermine the compliance with the feeble rules that were put in place as a substitute for political union. And Europe doesn't have an answer to that. And it will come back to bite Europe in the, in the, no, over the coming years. Mr. Vier, your approach, what do we have to do within the EU? First of all, in order to answer the right questions and then to avoid what uh, Paul Thompson just said. Let me just remind Paul that one of the two finance ministers at the ECB is the former managing director of the IMF. So uh, 
I would argue that not only she, very much so, but not only she is well qualified for that role. Uh, look, I mean, the fundamental dilemma, as we as we all realize, uh, is uh, that if you call for solidarity within a monetary union, uh, be it either uh, through uh, monetary policy uh, or through fiscal policy or whatever, uh, it's a two-way street. And uh, you can uh, not only request others to come to your help, uh, you also must give up a certain amount of sovereignty uh, over your policies. That is exactly what Paul uh, meant when he said, uh, when he talked about the role of Brussels uh, in, uh, in a political uh, union. But of course, uh, such, a, uh, such a change is not something where you jump from no coordination uh, uh, to full political union. And uh, I still strongly believe uh, that we have to move step by step by step uh, along that continuum uh, and uh, need to have a uh, not only a rules-based system uh, that produces better policy outcomes, but some kind of political mechanism which increases the costs uh, of non-compliance. And we've tried quite a number of things over the past 20, nearly 25 years. Uh, the Stability and Growth Pact uh, had nuclear fines at the end of a very large, long, lengthy, and complex uh, series uh, of administrative and political steps. It never worked because it was just too uh, uh, unbelievably nuclear. Uh, we, for a time, uh, there was a belief that the no bailout clause uh, was was a valid one. And as long as people believed that, uh, there was also a certain strength uh, in, or a, a, a harness around a national policy making. So we need to devise uh, some kind of methodology, how political costs for prime ministers, how political costs for finance ministers were significantly increased uh, if they run bad policies. Uh, that can be accountability uh, to appear before the European Parliament, naming and shaming. There are many uh, different variants, none of them 100% uh, satisfactory. But what is clear to me, and is clear obviously to Paul as well, the belief in the no bailout clause of the treaty uh, has been uh, shattered, and there is no way of going back to that. And the sooner uh, we come to admit that uh, in polit politics, economics, uh, and also uh, uh, legally speaking, uh, the better uh, it is. Let's, uh, I offer you one uh, thought experiment. Uh, how is it uh, in the United States with uh, the state of, let's pick Mississippi, uh, which uh, runs a sometimes astonishingly uh, separate, as many others do, uh, environmental policy, uh, social policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it works in the US, uh, but there are two consequences or three consequences. One, uh, there is a, a higher degree of reliance uh, on federal uh, funds and the federal tax policy. Secondly, uh, the talented people get on the Greyhound and they uh, move to Georgia, Massachusetts, and God knows what. And thirdly, uh, there is an acceptance in the United States of very, very different levels uh, of income per capita and poverty, uh, which is why Mississippi is where it is uh, in the ranking uh, of uh, US uh, states. And that uh, is also a possibility uh, for Europe, but it is not a way uh, I would want uh, Europe uh, to go. So uh, for the medium term, which is over the next 10, 15 years, uh, we've got to uh, realize there would be no uh, significant pooling of uh, sovereignty. Uh, I don't think there will be a bailout. I share the concerns of Paul 
what happens uh, when uh, uh, there is mean reversal in, in, in monetary policy. Uh, but for now, things are quiet and financial markets change their tone every six months. And uh, contacts tell me, oh, there is absolutely no concern at all. Um, are there any spreads? Interest rates are low. Uh, and uh, we know uh, that these things uh, don't stay there, stay as they are uh, for eternity, but can turn around pretty fast. So that I'm, I'm sure that the Greek political system has it in it, uh, if it is willing to have a national debate uh, on what the problems are, if it is willing to have such a national debate, uh, I believe uh, there is a willingness to change. Uh, but indeed, uh, Prime Minister Papandreou uh, was, uh, uh, was punished for trying to have that debate. And as peculiar as it sounds, I think uh, uh, some of the ministers around Alexis Tsipras uh, were also cognizant of many of the problems that Greek was fa facing, but they fell into the same traps uh, as, uh, the, as the previous government. Thank you, Mr. Wieser. We are running out of time. We have run out of time. I, I have to ask a dozen of questions. I would like to ask a dozen of questions. Uh, regarding the online questions, all of them have been answered. All of them were more or less what we should have done differently, like Mr. Chrysantho asks. So uh, my hope is to meet you both in Athens after this mess we are living in uh, is over in the post-pandemic era. And I would, like, I would like to thank you both, gentlemen, Mr. Uh, Thompson, Mr. Visa. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thank Great you. Pleasure. Both of you. Bye. I look for, I Bye. look forward to meeting both of you, wherever it may be. <laughs> Thanks very you much. Me Have a nice evening. I owe you a couple of beers, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.
Hello everyone, my name is Joan Hoey. I'm the Director for Europe at the Economist Intelligence Unit in London. Welcome back to this special Economist virtual event commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution. So far we've been focused very much on the public finances and public debt of Greece and the underlying causes um, of the problems in that regard. Now we're going to look at the business and investment environment. And to do that, we have a panel of seven speakers who I will now introduce in turn, all of whom will speak for four to five minutes and then we will have a discussion. So the first speaker is Panos Tsakloglu, De Deputy Minister for Social Insurance, Ministry of Labour and Social Affairs of Greece. The next speaker is Tassos Yanitsis, Professor, University of Athens and former Minister of Labour and Social Affairs of Greece. George Huliarakis, Senior Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and former Alternate Minister of Finance of Greece. George Papa Constantinou, former Minister of Finance of Greece and now Director for Executive Education at the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute. George Taniskidis, the Chairman of Optima Bank. Aristos Dokiadis, Economist and Sociologist and Partner at Big Pie Ventures. And then finally, last but not least, Faye Makantazi, Senior Research Analyst at DNAosis. That's our seven speakers. Welcome all of you. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion, which got a different flavor to some of the previous ones. So we are always running up again time. So I would just ask you to try to keep your introductory remarks to the four or five minutes so that we get time for questions and discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the speakers in the order that I introduced you. So starting with Panos, welcome. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, following the instructions, I speak in Greek. Ε, καταρχήν, θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω του δύο οργανωτέ του συνεδρίου για την πρόσκλησή του να συμμετάσχω στη σημερινή συζήτηση σε ένα πραγματικά εκλεκτό πάνελ. Η Ελλάδα στάθηκε πραγματικά άτυχη ω προ τη χρονική συγκυρία τη πανδημία. Η χώρα έβγαινε από μακρά και οξία οικονομική κρίση. Το δημόσιο χρέο ήταν εξαιρετικά υψηλό, αλλά εντελώ ασυνήθιστα χαρακτηριστικά του το καθιστούσαν διαχειρίσιμο, τουλάχιστον βραχυπρόθεσμα και, και μεσοπρόθεσμα. Πολύ μακρέ περίοδοι αποπληρωμή, χαμηλά επιτόκια και στο συντριπτικό μέρο του διακρατικό. Παρά τι απαιτήσει για υψηλά πρωτογενή πλεονάσματα, οι μεσοπρόθεσμε προοπτικέ τη οικονομία, σύμφωνα με τι εκτιμήσει διεθνών οργανισμών και διεθνών οίκων, ήταν ευείονε. Οι οικονομικέ συνέπειε τη πανδημία ήταν ιδιαίτερα δυσμένε, λόγω τόσο τη επιβολή περιοριστικών μέτρων για την αποφυγή τη εξάπλωση τη πανδημία, όσο και τη μεγάλη συμβολή στο ακαθάριστο εγχώριο προϊόν κλάδων που επλήγησαν με μεγάλη σφοδρότητα από την κρίση. Ιδιαίτερα ο τουρισμό, αλλά όχι μόνο, ήταν και η εστίαση, το λιανεμπόριο, οι διεθνεί μεταφορέ κ.ο.κ. Είχαμε μια κατάσταση όπου α, η επίπτωση του ΑΕΠ ήταν σημαντικότατη, ενώ τα μέτρα για τη στήριξη τη οικονομία μετέτρεψαν τα πρωτογενή πλεονάσματα σε υψηλά ελλείμματα και ανέβασαν το λόγο χρέου προ ακαθάριστο εγχώριο προϊόν σε ποσοστό άνω του 200%. Η συμμετοχή τη Ελλάδα στο πρόγραμμα Ποσοτική Χαλάρωση Ευρωπαϊκή Κεντρική Τράπεζα ήταν αποφασιστική σημασία για την απρόσκοπτη χρηματοδότηση των ελλημάτων και την αναχρηματοδότηση του δημοσίου χρέου. Και ιδίω θα έλεγα για την απορρόφηση των κραδασμών που σε διαφορετική περίπτωση θα μπορούσαν να έχουν ιδιαίτερα αρνητικέ συνέπειε. Σε γενικέ γραμμέ, η διαχείριση των οικονομικών συνεπειών τη κρίση τη πανδημία μπορεί να θεωρηθεί επιτυχή. Ναι, μεν η μείωση του ΑΕΠ στην Ελλάδα το 2020 ήταν μεγάλη, αλλά όχι η μεγαλύτερη στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Όπω προέβλεπαν στην αρχή τη κρίση όλοι ανεξαιρέτω οι διεθνεί οργανισμοί, και αρκετά μικρότερη σε μέγεθο από τι αρχικέ εκτιμήσει. Επιπρόσθετα, το ποσοστό ενεργεία παρέμεινε σε υψηλά επίπεδα, όμω η μεταβολή του στη διάρκεια τη πανδημία ήταν η δεύτερη καλύτερη στην Ένωση μετά την Ιταλία. Η επόμενη μέρα δεν προβλέπεται ανέφελη. Όμω, κατά την άποψή μου, οι μεσοπρόθεσμε προοπτικέ τη οικονομία είναι καλέ. Δύο είναι οι κύριοι προθετικοί παράγοντε, επενδύσει και διαρθρωτικέ μεταρρυθμίσει. Πάντα εδώ και αρκετά χρόνια, το ποσοστό των επενδύσεων στο ΑΕΠ στο ΑΕ στην Ελλάδα είναι μακράν το χαμηλότερο στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Σειρά μελετών δείχνουν ότι η ελληνική οικονομία. Έχει δυναμικό συγκριτικό πλεονέκτημα στην παραγωγή συγκεκριμένων αγαθών και υπηρεσιών. Με άλλα λόγια, οι επενδυτικέ ευκαιρίε υπάρχουν. 
Το μοναδικό κόστο εργασία που κατά τη διάρκεια τη δεκαετ... δεκαετία ε, τη ένταξη στην Ευρωζώνη αυξανόταν με ταχύ ρυθμού, έχει μειωθεί σημαντικά, ενώ η χώρα διαθέτει εργατικό δυναμικό αρκετά υψηλού εκπαιδευτικού επίπεδου, μεγάλο μέρο του οποίου δυστυχώ βρίσκεται σε κατάσταση ανεργία ή υποαπασχόληση και επομένω μπορεί να απασχοληθεί άμεσα σε θέσει εργασία που θα προκύψουν από νέε επενδύσει. Πέραν τη απεβαιότητα, η οποία έχει υποχωρήσει σημαντικά τα τελευταία χρόνια, ένα από του πλέον σοβαρού ανασταλτικού παράγοντε για την υλοποίηση επενδύσεων ήταν η έλλειψη χρηματοδοτικών πόρων. Στην παρούσα συγκυρία, με πόρου στο Σταμείο Ανάπτυξη διαθέσιμου να χρηματοδοτήσουν το φιλόδοξο πρόγραμμα που ετοίμασε η ελληνική κυβέρνηση, αλλά και του πόρου του ΕΣΠΑ, τη σταδιακή επανένταξη των ελληνικών τραπεζών στι διεθνεί αγορέ κεφαλαίου, αλλά και τι αυξημένε τον τελευταίο καιρό από τα μύευση των ελληνικών νοικοκυριών, στο βαθμό που αυτέ δεν αποτελούν απλώ αναβληθεί σε κατανάλωση. Σοβαρό πρόβλημα πόρων για τη χρηματοδότηση των επενδύσεων δεν φαίνεται να υπάρχει. Ω προ τι διαρθρωτικέ μεταρρυθμίσει, και θα ήθελα να τονίσω η έλλειψη των οποίων συντέλεσε τα μέγιστα στο να οδηγηθούμε στην κρίση τη προηγούμενη δεκαετία, δεν πρέπει να λησμονούμε ότι κατά τη διάρκεια των προγραμμάτων προσαρμογή η Ελλάδα υλοποίησε μεγάλο αριθμό μεταρρυθμίσεων. Η πανδημία δεν σταμάτησε τη μεταρρυθμιστική προσπάθεια, όπω φαίνεται κυρίω από την απότομη ψηφιακή ενηλικίωση τμήματων του δημόσιου τομέα, αλλά και από την προετοιμασία. Σημαντικών διαρθρωτικών μεταρρυθμίσεων που θα έρθουν στη Βουλή προ ψήφιση στο αμέσω επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα, όπω για παράδειγμα τα δύο εμβληματικά νομοσχέδια του δικού μου Υπουργείου, του Υπουργείου Εργασία, τόσο για τι εργασιακέ σχέσει, όσο και για την επικουρική ασφάλιση. Υπάρχουν όμω και δύο σημαντικέ προκλήσει. Η πρώτη έχει να κάνει με το τραπεζικό σύστημα. Τα τελευταία χρόνια οι ελληνικέ τράπεζε υλοποιούν φιλόδοξα προγράμματα για να καθαρίσουν του ισολογισμού από τα μη εξυπηρετούμενα δάνεια και ανοίγματα. Όμω είναι πολύ πιθανόν ότι έχουμε μπροστά μα μια νέα γενιά μη εξυπηρετούμενων δανείων από επιχειρήσει που δεν θα μπορέσουν να ανταπεξέλθουν τι συνέπειε τη πανδημία. Επομένω, οι όποιε προσπάθειε ενίσχυση των ισολογισμών των τραπεζών πρέπει να επιταχυνθούν είτε μέσω του προγράμματο Ηρακλή είτε με οποιοδήποτε άλλο πρόσφορο τρόπο. Η δεύτερη πρόκληση έχει να κάνει εν μέρη με εξωτερικού παράγοντε. Προφανώ το υψηλό δημόσιο χρέο πρέπει να αποκλιμακωθεί. Η εμπειρία τόσο τη προηγούμενη δεκαετία όσο και των ευρωπαϊκών χωρών μετά το δεύτερο παγκόσμιο πόλεμο δείχνει ότι αυτό είναι προτιμότερο να γίνει. Μέσω ταχύτερη ανάπτυξη παρά μέσω παραδεταμένη λιτότητα. Ο προπολογισμό θα επιστρέψει σε πρωτογενή πλεονάσματα, όμω οι απαιτήσει πολύ υψηλών πλεονασμάτων μπορεί να οδηγήσουν σε ασφιξία την οικονομία με προφανεί αρνητικέ συνέπειε. Επιπρόσθετα, η εμπειρία των τελευταίων ετών δείχνει ότι πέρα από κάθε αμφιβολία, η παραμονή τη Ελλάδα κάτω από την ομπρέλα τη προστασία τη Ευρωπαϊκή Κεντρική Τράπεζα έχει θετικότατε επιπτώσει στι αναπτυξιακέ προοπτικέ τη χώρα. Εν κατακλείδη, μπορεί το δημόσιο χρέο να είναι υψηλό, αλλά οι ευκαιρίε και οι πόροι υπάρχουν και με το κατάλληλο μείγμα πολιτική η Ελλάδα μπορεί να επιτύχει σύντομα υψηλού ρυθμού οικονομική μεγέθυνση. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ. Thank you very much indeed. And so now let me turn to Ms. Pagliana. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to the second speaker. Mr. Ioannidis, the professor at the University of Athens and former Minister of Labour and Social Affairs. Thank you very much. Καλησπέρα στους ακροατές και όλους. Θα σε αναπτύξω τις θέσεις μου σε τρία σημεία. Το πρώτο, έχουμε δύο δεδομένα. Το δημόσιο χρέος αντιπροσωπεύει σήμερα το 2020 το 205 και πάνω της εκατό του ΑΕΠ και επενδύσεις από 57,5 δισεκατομμύρια ευρώ το 2008 κινούνται στα 18,5 δισεκατομμύρια ευρώ το 2019, όσο και το 1995. Το δημόσιο χρέος πιέζει ασφυκτικά για μια σειρά από πράγματα. Πιο οραματικές μορφές για κυβέρνησης, για τη δημιουργία επαρκού δημοσιονομικού χώρου ώστε να αντιμετωπίζονται απρόβλεπτες απειλές, για περιορισμό των αιτίων που αυξάνουν το ίδιο το χρέο και για μια δημοσιονομική πολιτική που θα αποτρέπει κινδύνου αποσταθεροποίηση ή και νέων μνημονίων. Τελικά, το ζητούμενο, κατά τη γνώμη μου, ξεπερνάει το ει επενδύσει. Είναι πόσε συνθήκε υπερχρέωση και ενό τραυματισμένου παραγωγικού συστήματο θα πετύχουμε μεγέθυνση που δεν θα τορματώνεται γύρω στο 2%. Το δεύτερο σημείο είναι ότι η προσθήκη 5,5 δισεκατομμύριων ευρώ το χρόνο που θα εισρεύσουν για έξι χρόνια από το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης, είναι σημαντική και καταρχάς θα μειώσει κάπως το επενδυτικό χάσμα. Βέβαια, αντίστοιχε φάσεις και ακόμα υψηλότερες εισρωές είχαμε και στο παρελθόν. Η εμπειρία είναι ότι πέρα από τον όγκο, ιδιαίτερα κρίσιμα είναι τα ποιοτικά χαρακτηριστικά των επενδύσεων. Πώς αν προσανατολίσουμε δημόσιες και ιδιωτικές επενδύσεις προς τους κεντρικούς 
και συνεχώ μεταβαλλόμενου παράγοντε κλειδιά τη ανάπτυξη, είτε στο μακροοικονομικό, είτε στο επιχειρησιακό, στο επιχειρηματικό πεδίο, πώ θα προσελκύσουμε τεχνολογικά προωθημένε ξένε επενδύσει και άμεσε επενδύσει, και πώ θα επικεντρωθούμε στην αύξηση τη ολική παραγωγικότητα, αυτό που λέγεται total factor productivity. Και αυτό με οδηγεί στο τρίτο σημείο. Ο στόχο τη ολική παραγωγικότητα θα έκανε τη μεγάλη διαφορά σε σύγκριση με το παρελθόν, καθώ αποτελεί το κρίσιμο κλειδί τη ανάπτυξη, ιδίω όταν οι πόροι είναι στριμωγμένοι. Οι επενδύσει είναι αναγκαία, αλλά όχι επαρκή συνθήκη για την ανάπτυξη. Ολική παραγωγικότητα δεν σημαίνει μόνο επενδύσει σε πάγια, αλλά και σε άειλα στοιχεία. Τη σχέση κράτου-αγορά, την εκπαίδευση, τη λειτουργία των θεσμών. Αναδιάρθρωση τη παραγωγική βάση και επέκτασή τη σε νέε εξελιγμένε δραστηριότητε. Σημαίνει επίση επικέντρωση επενδύσεων σε υποδομέ, κλάδου και επιχειρήσει με στόχο μια ανταγωνιστικότερη παραγωγική βάση. Να θυμίσω ότι σήμερα οι μεσαίε ή μεγάλε επιχειρήσει σε όλου του τομεί τη χώρα φτάνουν τι 492 μόνο, δηλαδή το 0,07 του συνολικού αριθμού επιχειρήσεων. Στα χρόνια της κρίσης όμως, οι μονάδες αυτές έδειξαν τη μεγαλύτερη αντοχή, δημιούργησαν απασχόληση και διασφάλισαν καλύτερες αμοιβέ. Αυτές συγκροτούν τον κεντρικό αλλά ισχνό αναπτυξιακό κορμό της οικονομίας. Έμφαση στην παραγωγικότητα σημαίνει επίσης έμφαση στην τεχνολογία και τις νέες γνώσεις και στο μετασχηματισμό μιας νοσιολογικής βάσης που ξεπερνιέται ραγδαία. Να θυμίσω ότι σήμερα το εκπαιδευτικό μας σύστημα διαμορφώνει νέους που στην πλειοψηφία του αδυνατούν να διεκδικήσουν μισθό πάνω από 600 με 800 ευρώ ή καν απασχόληση. Παραγωγικότητα, επιχειρηματικότητα και ανάπτυξη δεν απαιτούν μόνο οικονομικέ παρεμβάσει. Αφορούν και σημαντικέ πολιτικέ και κοινωνικέ παραμέτρου. Συγκρουσιακά φαινόμενα και καταστάσει, αντιεπενδυτικέ πρακτικέ, inclusive, συμπεριληπτικέ δηλαδή στρατηγικέ, τη σχέση ανάπτυξη και εμπιστοσύνη. Αρκετά από αυτά υπερβαίνουν το συμβατικό πεδίο της κρατικής πολιτικής. Όμως κάθε σοβαρός επενδυτής σταθμίζει τις συνολικές πολιτικές ή οικονομικές αβεβαιότητες που μπορεί να συναντήσει στο μακρύ κύκλο μιας επένδυσης, ας πούμε 20 χρόνια τουλάχιστον, και όχι στον εκλογικό ορίζοντα λίγων ετών. Α σκεφτούμε τις εμπειρίες κάποιου επενδυτής στην Ελλάδα σε διάφορες κοσαετίες, π.χ. το 60 με 80 ή το 2000 με το 2020 ή κάποια άλλη ενδιάμεση. Και τι σήμαινε γι' αυτόν. Ολοκληρώνω επισημένοντας ότι βρισκόμαστε σε μια περίοδο πολλαπλών και απρόβλεπτων μακροοικονομικών, αναπτυξιακών και κοινωνικών πιέσεων που κάνουν αναγκαίες ιεραρχήσεις και πολιτικές πρόληψεις, μετρίασης, διαχείρισης και εξισορρόψεις κινδύνων συνολικά, αλλά και αξιοποίηση ευκαιριών όπου θα παρουσιάζονται. Οι πόροι που θα εισρεύσουν στη χώρα μα επιτρέπουν να αντιμετωπίσουμε από καλύτερη θέση αυτέ τι πιέσει και παρά το βάρο του χρέου να ανακτήσουμε σταδιακά τι προποθέσει ώστε τα επόμενα χρόνια να αποτελέσουν τη μετάβαση από την προβληματική περίοδο 2009-2020-2021 σε μια πραγματικότητα που θα σηματοδοτεί με θετικό τρόπο το πέρασμα στην τρίτη εκατονταετία τη νεότερη ιστορία μα. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much, Professor. Our next speaker is George Fuliarakis. Uh, welcome. I think you're muted, George. Um, I'm not sure if we've lost the connection with George. Um, let's, um, let's move to the next speaker and we can bring in Mr. Huliarakis after that. So let me turn now to George Papa Constantinou um, to hear your remarks. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation and it's good to be with this uh, company. Um, θα κάνω μερικές παρατηρήσεις ε, ακούγοντας και τον Μάνο Τσακλό και τον Τάσο Γιαννίτσι. Νομίζω πως πρέπει να ξεκινήσουμε από το πού θα βρεθεί η ελληνική οικονομία όταν με το καλό η κρίση είναι, του κορονοϊού είναι πίσω μας, η υγειονομική κρίση. 
Θα βρεθεί με ένα δημόσιο χρέος το οποίο θα είναι πάνω από 200% με ε, την ανάγκη σε ένα μεγαλύτερο χρονικό διάστημα να μειώσει τα, ε, τα ελλείμματα τα οποία θα έχουν δημιουργηθεί αλλά ταυτοχρόνως ε, θα, θα βρεθεί και με τον, τους πόρους από τα ευρωπαϊκά ε, ταμεία αυτούς που πρέπει να αξιοποιήσουμε το Εθνικό Σχέδιο Ανάκαμψης. Ξέρουμε από το παρελθόν ότι ε, σημαντικό ε, παράγοντα ε, στην δυνατότητα της ελληνικής οικονομίας να ανακάμψει έπαιζαν οι, οι εξωτερικοί όροι. Με άλλα λόγια, ε, το, το περιβάλλον μέσα στο οποίο κινείται η Ελλάδα και άρα το περιβάλλον στο οποίο οι διεθνείς αγορές ε, ε, αντιδρούσαν. Σε σχέση με το παρελθόν, ε, αυτή τη στιγμή και ελπίζουμε για τα επόμενα δύο-τρία χρόνια ε, το περιβάλλον θα είναι θετικό για τη χώρα. Ε, έχουμε μία ε, Ευρωπαϊκή Κεντρική Τράπεζα η οποία έχει πλέον ένα τεράστιο χαρτοφυλάκιο η οποία θα συνεχίσει να έχει την ίδια πολιτική τουλάχιστον για κάποια χρόνια ακόμα. Έχουμε ένα ε, 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 δημοσιονομικό πλαίσιο εξαιρετικά χαλαρό σε ευρωπαϊκό επίπεδο και έχουμε πάρα πολύ χαμηλά επιτόκια και ε, τις διεθνείς αγορές να, να αντιμετωπίζουν ακόμα και χώρες με το υψηλό χρέος, ε, υψηλό χρέος σαν το δικό μας, με πολύ ευμενός. Αυτό δεν το έχει ποτέ στο παρελθόν η Ελλάδα. Άρα είναι μια μοναδική ευκαιρία, ένα παράθυρο ευκαιρίας, το οποίο όμως κάποια στιγμή θα κλείσει. Το ζητούμενο λοιπόν είναι μέσα σε αυτό το παράθυρο ευκαιρία, εάν εμείς θα κινηθούμε κατάλληλα για να μπορέσουμε να, ανατρα... να ανατρέψουμε την δυναμική του λόγου χρέος ως προς το ΑΕΠ. Και αυτό μπορεί να γίνει μόνο από τον παρονομαστή. Προφανώς ο αριθμητής δεν μπορεί να αλλάξει πάρα πολύ σε αυτό το χρονικό διάστημα. Το μόνο που μπορεί να αλλάξει είναι η δυναμική του παρονομαστή. Εδώ λοιπόν έρχεται το Εθνικό Σχέδιο Ανάκαμψης. Ε, οι, οι, οι δυνατότητες που θα δημιουργήσει, το κλίμα γύρω από αυτό ε, και... Πρέπει να πω ότι ε, και συγκριτικά γιατί στο Ευρωπαϊκό Πανεπιστήμιο έχουμε δει και, τα, τα, ε, και παρακολουθεί τη συζήτηση με τα σχέδια ανάκαμψης ε, και των άλλων χωρών η, η, το σχέδιο το οποίο έχει παρουσιάσει η ελληνική κυβέρνηση είναι, είναι άρτιο τεχνοκρατικά ε, έχει πάρα πολλά θετικά στοιχεία μπορεί κανένας να, να μιλήσει για ε, να κάνει κριτικές ε, 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 σε ορισμένα σημεία αλλά γενικά στέκεται ως ένα συνδυασμό επενδυτικών προγραμμάτων και μεταρρυθμίσεων. Αλλά ξέρουμε πάρα πολύ καλά ότι στη δική μας τη χώρα πολλά εξαρτώνται από την υλοποίηση. Πολλά εξαρτώνται από το σύστημα διακυβέρνησης με το οποίο αυτό το πρόγραμμα θα μπορέσει να γίνει πραγματικότητα. Το governance, με άλλα λόγια. Και από όλους τους μηχανισμούς υλοποίησης που θα κάνουν τη διαφορά ανάμεσα σε ένα σχέδιο το οποίο πάνω στο χαρτί ακούγεται και διαβάζεται καλά και ένα σχέδιο το οποίο θα υλοποιηθεί για να δημιουργήσει παραγωγικότητα, να δημιουργήσει θέσεις εργασία, να δημιουργήσει επενδύσεις, να δημιουργήσει και ένα διαφορετικό κλίμα για τη χώρα. Εδώ λοιπόν είναι που πρέπει να, να, να εστιάσουμε και εδώ ένα από τα ζητήματα το οποίο λείπει είναι και πάλι και τότε στο παρελθόν είναι την ανάγκη να δημιουργηθεί γύρω από αυτό το σχέδιο και μια κοινωνική αποδοχή. Γιατί ε, ε, ένα σχέδιο όσο καλό και να είναι τεχνοκρατικά για να μπορέσει να λειτουργήσει ως κινητήρια δύναμη της οικονομίας τα επόμενα χρόνια πρέπει να έχει συζητηθεί πρέπει να έχει ε, 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 έτσι μία, μία δυνατότητα να, να το στηρίξουν οι παραγωγικές δομές της χώρας εκεί λοιπόν υπάρχει για μένα μία, ένα έλλειμμα το οποίο τώρα που το σχέδιο πλέον είναι λίγο πολύ έτοιμο και θα εγκριθεί είναι καλό να, να μπορέσει να, 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 να αντιμετωπιστεί με τις κατάλληλες ενέργειες για να μπορέσουμε στον, στη διαδικασία υλοποίηση ε, να υπάρξει η αποδοχή, η κοινωνική αποδοχή που χρειάζεται. Άρα λοιπόν, εάν και κλείνοντα, ε, το παράθυρο ευκαιρία είναι μικρό, η χώρα θα χρειαστεί σε μερικά χρόνια από τώρα να ξεκινήσει πάλι πολιτικέ, οι οποίε δεν θα είναι πολιτικέ λιτότητα τη κρίση, όμω θα είναι πολιτικέ συμμαζέματο των δημοσίων οικονομικών. Για να μπορέσει λοιπόν αυτές τις πολιτικές να είναι βιώσιμες θα πρέπει να έχουμε προχωρήσει και να έχουμε δώσει δείγματα γραφής για μια αναπτυξιακή δυναμική η οποία θα προέλθει μέσα από αυτό το επενδυτικό σχέδιο. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I believe we've got George Huliarakis back. Um, we just momentarily lost the connection. So I'm going to hand over to you now, George. Welcome. 
Yes, I hope you can now hear me well. Um, thank you. Okay, yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Wonderful. So, um, στο, στο λίγο χρόνο που, uh, που διαθέτουμε, θα ήθελα να κάνω uh, τρει uh, κρίσιμε παρατηρήσει. Η πρώτη παρατήρηση είναι ότι το κρίσιμο μέγεθο uh, για την uh, πορεία τη χώρα τα επόμενα χρόνια δεν είναι τόσο το ύψο του δημοσίου χρέου, αλλά η ικανότητα τη χώρα να το εξυπηρετεί χωρί να χρειάζεται ιδιαίτερα υψηλά πλεονάσματα. Και η ικανότητα μια χώρα να εξυπηρετεί το δημόσιο χρέο τη χωρί υψηλά πλεονάσματα και κατά συνέπεια χωρί να επιβαρύνει την ιδιωτική οικονομική δραστηριότητα εξαρτάται από πολλού παράγοντε. Πρώτα απ' όλα εξαρτάται από την αξιοπιστία στην άσκηση τη δημοσιονομική πολιτική. Εξαρτάται επίση από τα βασικά χαρακτηριστικά του χρέου. Και αναφέρομαι εδώ κυρίω στη μέση περίοδο ορίμανση του δημόσιου χρέου, στη σύνθεση των πιστωτών, στο τμήμα του χρέου το οποίο είναι εκπεφτασμένο σε ξένο νόμισμα. Αλλά ένα πολύ σημαντικό μέγεθος είναι η διαφορά των ονομαστικών επιτοκίων από το ρυθμό οικονομικής μεγέθυνσης. Και σε ένα περιβάλλον α, χαμηλών επιτοκίων, αν θέλετε, σε ένα περιβάλλον που η διαφορά των επιτοκίων από το ρυθμό οικονομικής μεγέθυνσης είναι αρνητική, όπως συμβαίνει σε χώρες... Α, τον οποίο το χρέο αποτελεί ασφαλέ καταφύγιο. Η μείωση του χρέου μπορεί να προκύψει χωρί επιβάρυνση τη οικονομική δραστηριότητα, χωρί δηλαδή παραγωγή πλεονασμάτων, του αντίον, χώρε αυτέ μπορούν να ανεχτούν ακόμα και υψηλά ελλείμματα, ώστε, ώστε να τονώσουν την οικονομική ανάκαμψη, μειώνοντα ταυτόχρονα το λόγο χρέου ω προ το έπινε. Είναι ακριβώ αυτό που νομίζω συμβαίνει. Ε, ήδη και θα συμβεί τα επόμενα χρόνια α, στις, α, στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες. Θα ήταν όμως λάθος να α, καταλήξουμε στο συμπέρασμα ότι η αρχή αυτή έχει καθολική εφαρμογή. Δεν υπάρχει καμιά αμφιβολία πως σε, χω, σε χώρες με θετικά ή ακόμα και μεγάλα ασφάλιστρα κινδύνου, όπως είναι η Ελλάδα, το υψηλό δημόσιο χρέος κανονικά θα αποτελούσε εμπόδιο στην ιδιωτική οικονομική δραστηριότητα, είτε επειδή συνεπάγεται Uh, υψηλή μελλοντική φορολογία, είτε επειδή συνεπάγεται υψηλό κόστος δανεισμού των ιδιωτικών επιχειρήσεων, είτε διότι η υψηλή αβεβαιότητα αποθαρρύνει uh, την, uh, την uh, οικονομική δραστηριότητα του ιδιωτικού τομέα. Όλα όσα κανείς γνωρίζει ως uh, debt overhand. Και στις περιπτώσεις αυτές προφανώς uh, η μόνη λύση είναι η αναδιάρθρωση του δημοσίου χρέους. Η Ελλάδα όμω, και αυτό είναι το δεύτερο, η δεύτερη παρατηρήσή μου, η Ελλάδα όμω δεν βρίσκεται εκεί. Παρότι έχει τα χαρακτηριστικά μια χώρα που α, δεν θα μπορούσε να α, α, ωφεληθεί από την αρνητική διαφορά επιτοκίων και ρυθμού μεγέθυνση, η Ελλάδα είναι στην εξαιρετικά α, ευνοϊκή θέση να έχει α, πολύ χαμηλέ ακαθάριστε χρηματοδοτικέ ανάγκε για, για, για το βραχή και μέσο χρόνο. Θα έλεγε τα επόμενα περίπου 10 χρόνια, με σταθερά χαμηλά επιτόκια, με χρέο στα χέρια του επίσημου τομέα, κατά βάση, και με ένα σημαντικό ταμιακό απόθεμα που μπορεί να καλύψει τις εξωτερικές υποχρεώσεις για αρκετά α, τρίμηνα. Δεδομένου το ότι οι δαπάνες που σχετίζονται με την πανδημία είναι κατά βάση προσωρινές, δεν βλέπω πρόβλημα βιωσιμότητα του ελληνικού χρέου για τα επόμενα πέντε ή δέκα χρόνια. Η τρίτη παρατήρηση και τελευταία παρατήρηση που θέλω να κάνω στην, στην πρωτομιλία μου είναι ότι α, παρόλα αυτά τα κρίσιμα μεγέθη για την μακροπρόθεσμη βιωσιμότητα του ε, ελληνικού χρέους α, παραμένουν ανοιχτά και αυτά είναι πρώτον το χαμηλό κόστος δανεισμού για όσο περισσότερο καιρό γίνεται και εδώ φυσικά το κρίσιμο μέγεθος είναι η πολιτική της Ευρωπαϊκής Κεντρικής Τράπεζας, η οποία θα πρέπει να παραταθεί και η ελληνική κυβέρνηση θα πρέπει να διεκδικήσει να παραταθεί για αρκετά χρόνια με τη ριστικά που έχει σήμερα, με την ενεργή δηλαδή δράση του Ταμείου Πανδημίας. Το δεύτερο κρίσιμο μέγεθος είναι ο ρυθμός ανάκαμψης της ελληνικής οικονομίας από την, από την κρίση που 
προκαλεί η πανδημία. Εδώ προφανώς το Ευρωπαϊκό Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης και Ανθεκτικότητας θα παίξει ένα κρίσιμο ρόλο, αλλά δεν μπορεί να είναι πια. Το Ταμείο αυτό έχει κύριο ρόλο την ανακατανομή της οικονομικής δραστηριότητας σε δράσεις φιλικές προς το περιβάλλον και σε δράσεις που προωθούν την ψηφιοποίηση της οικονομίας κυρίως. Δεν καλύπτουν όμως κλάδους της οικονομικής δραστηριότητας που έχουν πληγεί ιδιαίτερα από την πανδημία και κατά συνέπεια ακριβώς στην περιοχή αυτή η, η, η σημερινή κυβέρνηση έχει μια, ένα μεγάλο στοίχημα και μια μεγάλη πρόκληση. Ποιε δράσει θα αναπτυχθούν προκειμένου να καλυφθεί, α, να, να στηριχθεί η οικονομική δραστηριότητα στου κλάδου που κυρίω έχουν ε, πληγεί α, από την πανδημία. Τρίτο και τελευταίο σημείο, α, η, προώθηση, η, συ, η συνεχή προώθηση των μεταρρυθμίσεων, που κατά τη γνώμη μου έχει ατονίσει την, ε, ε, στη διάρκεια τη πανδημία με στόχο την α, α, ανάδειξη, την απελευθέρωση, την αύξηση της α, α, παραγωγικής δυναμικότητας της χώρας με τρόπο συμπεριληπτικό που θα μειώνει τις οικονομικές ανισότητες. Θα σταματήσω εδώ. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker is George Taniskidis, the chairman of Optima Bank. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, καλησπέρα σε όλους. Θα μιλήσω για το χρέος. Θα προσπαθήσω να δώσω μερικά νούμερα. Έχουμε σήμερα περίπου 374 δις σε χρέος. Από αυτά τα 254 είναι σε χέρια ευρωπαϊκών θεσμών. Δηλαδή το 68%. Σε ασφαλή χέρια, όπως πολύ ωραία είπε ο Κόλιν Έλλης από τη Μούντις σε προηγούμενο session του συνεδρίου. Η μέση σταθμική διάρκεια του χρέους μας είναι σήμερα στα 19,4 χρόνια. Το 2011 ήταν στα 6,3 το μέσο σταθμικό μας επιτόκιο σήμερα είναι στο 1,72. Το 2011 ήταν στο 4,54. Το μέσο σταθμικό μας κόστος του νέου δανεισμού είναι σήμερα στο 1%. Το 2011 ήταν στο 5%. Συμπέρασμα. Μακρινές λήξεις. Χαμηλά επιτόκια πρωτογενή πλεονάσματα όταν τελειώσει η πανδημία και όπως ωραία είπε ο κύριος Κυλακάκης πάλι σε προηγούμενο session του συνεδρίου. Με μέτρο τα πλεονάσματα δημιουργούν την ασφαλή πεποίθηση ότι σήμερα στην Ελλάδα θέμα χρέους δεν έχουμε. Θα τολμούσα να πω ότι μάλλον μιλάμε για κάτι σαν perpetual bond. Όσον αφορά την πανδημία τώρα, εμείς είμαστε αισιόδοξοι. Και είμαστε αισιόδοξοι γιατί έχουμε πάει καλύτερα από την Ευρώπη. Στα κρούσματα είμαστε λίγο κάτω από το 3% ενώ ο μέσος όρος της Ευρώπης είναι στο 6%. Στους θανάτους η Ευρώπη είναι στο 0,14%. Εμείς είμαστε κάτι λίγο από το 0,08%. Αλλά και στους εμβολιασμού. Εμείς είμαστε στο 12% η Ευρώπη είναι στο 12%. Η αλήθεια είναι βέβαια ότι η οικονομία είχε μία ανακοπή στην ανωδική της πορεία λόγω της πανδημίας, αλλά πάλι εμείς είμαστε ελπιδοφόροι και μάλιστα ε, αν μπορεί κάποιος να πει ότι ανεκόπη η πορεία της οικονομίας οφείλεται κατά βάση στο γεγονός ότι το περσινό καλοκαίρι δεν πήγε καθόλου καλά από απόψε τουρισμού και ο τουρισμός αποτελεί συστατικό κομμάτι της υγείας της οικονομίας μας. Πιστεύουμε ότι βρισκόμαστε σε έναν ανωδικό κύκλο. Κάνουμε 
κάναμε, κάνουμε διαρθρωτικές μεταρρυθμίσεις. Κάθε μέρα που περνάει τώρα αυτή τη στιγμή μέσα στον εγκλισμό, το κράτος προάγεται τεχνολογικά, προάγεται ηλεκτρονικά, προχωράμε. Δεν χρειάζεται πια να πάω στο ΚΕΠ για να, κάνω, για να θεωρήσω το γνήσιο της υπογραφή μου. Έβγαλα διαβατήριο σε δύο μέρες, εγώ ο ίδιος. Θέλω να σας πω ότι έχουμε μία άνευ προηγουμένου δημοσιονομική παρέμβαση. Θα εισρεύσουν στην πατρίδα μας, αν βέβαια είμαστε ικανοί να τα απορροφήσουμε, περί τα 80 δις, από σήμερα μέχρι το 2027. Ελπίζουμε ότι 32 από αυτά θα εισρεύσουν μέσα στο χρόνο. Παγκοσμίως υπάρχει αυθονία ρευστότητα λόγω της εξερα... εξαιρετικά χαλαρής νομισματικής πολιτικής από τις κεντρικές τράπεζες. Έχουμε ένα ιστορικά χαμηλό κόστος δανεισμού τόσο για το κράτος όσο και για τον ιδιωτικό τομέα και φυσικά έχουμε μία συσσωρευμένη ζήτηση σε όλους τους τομείς και επάρκεια πόρων φυσικά λόγω της χαμηλής οικονομικής δραστηριότητας. Οι τράπεζες δε στην Ελλάδα πιστεύω ότι διαρκώς βελτιώνονται. Θα σας πω ότι σήμερα οι καταθέσεις υπερβαίνουν τις χορηγήσεις στο τραπεζικό σύστημα κατά 24 δις. 163 με 139. Αυτό είχαμε να το δούμε περίπου από το Σεπτέμβριο του 2003. Για να έχουμε απόλυτη γνώση της εικόνας, το 2015, ακριβώς πριν τα Capital Controls, είχαμε ένα gap μεταξύ καταθέσεων και χορηγήσεων 85 δις. Αλλά ήταν ανάποδο. Δηλαδή... Είχαμε 206 δις σε δάνεια και 121 δις σε, χω... σε καταθέσεις. Οι τράπεζες λοιπόν φαίνεται ότι τακτοποιούν τα του οίκου τους και στοχεύουν σε μονοψήφια ποσοστά σε non-performing exposures στους επόμενους 12 μήνες. Πράγμα πάρα πολύ σημαντικό. Όσον αφορά την Optima Bank, νομίζω ότι είμαστε αψευδείς μάρτυρες της αισιοδοξία που νομίζω υπάρχει. Στο, στο μέσο του 2019 τολμήσαμε να κάνουμε μία εξαγορά και να ξεκινήσουμε τη δημιουργία μιας τραπέζης. Πάρα πολλοί θεωρούσαν ότι αυτό είναι μία πολύ περίεργη απόφαση. Ενάμιση χρόνο μετά είμαστε πολύ χαρούμενοι. Έχουμε πολύ καλή ρευστότητα. Κάτω από 60% είναι η... τα δάνειά μας προς τις χορηγήσεις μας. Κάναμε μια αύξηση κεφαλαίου με πολύ μεγάλη επιτυχία. Οι επισφάλειές μας είναι κάτω από μισό τα εκατό. Δημιουργούμε με άλλα λόγια μια απλή, ευέλικτη, σύγχρονη τράπεζα. Μέσα σε όλη αυτή την αισιοδοξία που με διακατέχει, θέλω να πω ότι υπάρχει και μια στενοχώρια. Και με αυτή θα τελειώσω. 200 χρόνια πριν, οι πρόγονοί μας απεφάσισαν να ξεσηκωθούν και βεβαίως, Ίσως κάποιοι από αυτούς να προσέβλεπαν και σε κάποια βοήθεια από τους ξένους. Όμως κατά βάση ήταν αποφασισμένοι οι ίδιοι να δώσουν το αίμα τους για την πατρίδα τους. Έχω την εντύπωση σήμερα ότι ο μέσος Έλληνας περιμένει όχι να δώσει το αίμα του για την πατρίδα του, αλλά να έρθει κιόλα ο Άγγλος, Γάλλος, Πορτογάλος ή Αμερικάνος να πολεμήσει αυτός για αυτόν. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ.
thank you very much indeed. Um, very good to get the uh, view of the banking sector, which we haven't really had so far today. Our next speaker is Aristos Dokiadis, uh, economist and sociologist. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Εγώ δεν θα μιλήσω για το χρέος, αλλά θα μιλήσω για ένα τομέα της οικονομίας που δεν πολύ επηρεάζεται από το χρέος. Δηλαδή, για την οικονομία της γνώσης. Συσταγωγικά, όπως λέγεται, η οικονομία της γνώσης σημαίνει κυρίως δύο βασικά συστατικά. Το ένα είναι το οικοσύστημα της καινοτομίας, τα startups, αλλά και οι μεγάλες πολυεθνικές ε, της τεχνολογίας. Και το δεύτερο είναι οι εξαγώγημες επαγγελματικέ υπηρεσίε. Το σύστημα της καινοτομία, το πρώτο στοιχείο, έχει μεγαλώσει πάρα πολύ τα τελευταία δέκα χρόνια στην Ελλάδα. Ενδεικτικά, ε, τα startups που έχουν ε, ε, φτάσει σε κάποιο σημαντικό μέγεθος, η συνολική τους αποτίμηση σήμερα είναι περίπου 4 δις, ε, ενώ πριν από δέκα χρόνια ήταν κάτω από ένα δις. Απασχολούν περίπου 5.000 άτομα. Η απασχόληση στην πληροφορική γενικά, στα πέντε χρόνια από το 2013 ως το 2018 αυξήθηκε κατά 60%. Είναι περίπου 30.000 άτομα. Αυτά τα μεγέθη ακόμα είναι συγκριτικά μικρά σε σχέση με άλλες ευρωπαϊκές χώρες, αλλά η δυναμική είναι εκεί και συνεχίζεται. Και παράλληλα με αυτές υπάρχουν αρκετές πολυεθνικές εταιρείε που έχουν δημιουργήσει κέντρα έρευνας και ανάπτυξης στην Ελλάδα. Με πολλούς εργαζόμενους, 200, 500 κτλ. Pfizer, Deloitte, Nokia... Ernst Young, που χρησιμοποιεί προσωπικό από το Δημόκριτο κτλ. Γιατί υπάρχει αυτή η σχετική επιτυχία σε αυτούς τους τομείς. Γιατί χρειάζεται μικρή επένδυση, μικρή αρχική επένδυση, μισθή είναι το βασικό κόστος σε αυτά, επομένως χτίζεται σταδιακά, δεν χρειάζεται δάνεια για να χτιστεί, δεν επηρεάζεται από μακροοικονομικές ανισορροπίες, και δεν έχει μεγάλο πολιτικό ρίσκο, γιατί δεν είναι ότι δεσμεύει ένα δισεκατομμύριο από την αρχή, το χτίζει σιγά σιγά. Και αν ο Μιγέτη του έρθει μια κυβέρνηση που τι κυνηγάει τι επιχειρήσει αυτέ με διάφορου τρόπου, τα στελέχη μπορούν να μεταναστεύσουν σχετικά εύκολα, αν χρειαστεί. Γι' αυτό και έρχονται αυτά τα κέντρα πιο εύκολα από ότι έρχονται οι βιομηχανίε, αλλά γι' αυτό και φεύγουν πιο εύκολα. Θυμίζει αρκετά την ναυτιλία αυτό το μοντέλο, η ναυτιλία. Έχει ευδοκιμήσει στην Ελλάδα επειδή οι κυβερνήσει κατάλαβαν ότι αν πάνε να τις τριμώξουν πάρα πολύ, θα πάρουν τη βαλίτσα τους και θα φύγουν. Δεν είναι κάτι το οποίο πολύ εύκολα μπορεί να παρέμβει πολύ το κράτος σε αυτούς. Άλλο πλέον έκτημα είναι ότι έχουν αυτές οι επιχειρήσεις μικρή εμπλοκή με την γραφειοκρατία, δεν χρειάζονται άδειε δόμηση, δύσκολε άδειε λειτουργίε, περιβαλλοντικού όρου κτλ. Και υπάρχει και ένα άλλο που είναι πιο πολύ ειδικό ελληνικό ε, πλεονέκτημα, η διασπορά μας. Εγώ εργαζόμενος στο Big Five Ventures που επενδύουμε σε startups τεχνολογίας, ε, οι περισσότερες επενδύσεις μας πάνω από τις μισές είναι σε startups που οι ιδρυτές τους είναι Έλληνες της διασποράς. Ξεκίνησε είναι στην Αμερική, στη Γερμανία, στη Βρετανία, έχουν μάθει τις σχετικές αγορές, τους κλάδους, τους μεγάλους παίκτες, τους οποίους θέλουν να αναπτυχθούν, αλλά χτίζουν την έρευνα και ανάπτυξη του προϊόντος στην Ελλάδα. Και μπορεί να είναι, ας πούμε, το 1 τρίτο του δυναμικού στη Βοστόνη, τα 2 τρίτα στην Αθήνα. Ε, υπάρχει αυτό το μεγάλο πλεονέκτημα. Τώρα, τι επίδραση είχε η πανδημία σε αυτό το τομέα. Ε, Άκουγα χτε μια παρουσίαση μια μελέτη του, του κέντρου ΣΥΣΟΚ τη Οξφόρδη για του, τη διασπορά, ε, χρηματοδοτημένη από τη διανέωση, ότι μέσα στην πανδημία ένα δείγμα που είχαν και παρακολουθούσαν ένα 15% αυτών των ανθρώπων, των Ελλήνων τη Βρετανία, αυτού του δείγματο, το 15% έχει γυρίσει για να εργαστεί προσωρινά από το χωριό του, από το σπίτι του, από την πόλη του, στην Ελλάδα. Αυτό διευκολύνεται πάρα πολύ προφανώς από την τεχνολογία της τηλεργασίας. Επίσης, πέρα από το 15% που γύρισε προσωρινά, ένα 11% παραπάνω αυτού του δείγματος, από τον, όλο το 19 και το Μάιο του 20 γύρισε για μόνιμη εγκατάσταση στην Ελλάδα. Μέχρι το Μάιο του 20 είχαν μετρήσει. Και πάλι, η τηλεργασία βοηθάει πάρα, πάρα πολύ σε αυτό. Ο άλλος τομέας που θα αναφερθώ πολύ πιο σύντομα είναι λεγόμενε professional services, 
που μπορούν να εξαχθούν, που μπορούν να, να, να προσφέρονται από την Ελλάδα σε, σε πελάτες του εξωτερικού. Και είναι ε, ερευνητές, μηχανικοί, αρχιτέκτονες, σχεδιαστές, σύμβουλοι επιχειρήσεων, νομικοί, δημοσιογράφοι, καλλιτέχνε. Αυτοί επηρεάζονται περίπου από τους ίδιους παράγοντες που επηρεάζεται και το οικοσύστημα της καινοτομία. Εκεί υπάρχει υστέρηση. Δεν μοιάζει ο εξ, η εξαγωγική δραστηριότητα αυτών των επαγγελμάτων να έχει αυξηθεί ακόμα πολύ. Είναι ανωτική η τάση. Αλλά είμαστε ακόμα σε ένα σημείο που το 14% της προσθέμενης αξίας αυτού του κλάδου εξάγεται. Ε, έναντι 34% μέσω όρο για τις άλλες ευρωπαϊκές χώρες που έχουν το δικό μας μέγεθος. Άρα έχουμε ακόμα πολύ χώρο να αναπτυχθεί και αυτό. Τώρα, τα δύ- οι δύο αυτοί οι κλάδοι ε, έχουν, πέρα από τα μεγέθη τους, που δεν είναι τεράστια, έχουν ε, τα εξή πολύ μεγάλα πλεονεκτήματα, ότι είναι, ή μπορούν να είναι εξαγωγικοί, να μπουν σε διεθνείς αλυσίδες αξίας. Δεν είναι μόνο για την εσωτερική αγορά και η Ελλάδα έχει μεγάλη ανάγκη να αυξηθούν οι εξαγωγέ μα. Και το δεύτερο είναι ότι ακριβώ επειδή πρέπει να χτυπήσουν πολύ έντονο παγκόσμιο ανταγωνισμό, είναι πολύ πιο αξιοκρατικέ από τι επιχειρήσει που στοχεύουν μόνο στην ελληνική αγορά. Το βλέπουμε. Πόσο τα στελέχη αξιοποιούνται πολύ περισσότερο, πολύ καλύτερα στα startups από ό,τι στην τυπική ελληνική οικογενειακή επιχείρηση. Τι λείπει ακόμα για να τι βοηθήσουμε αυτέ. Το ένα είναι, στο επίπεδο των υποδομών, πρέπει να βελτιωθούν οι τηλεπικοινωνίες μας, τα broadband services. Εντάξει, δεν είναι τόσο δύσκολο όσο να βελτιώσουμε ενδεχομένως τα λιμάνια, τους υπηδρόμους και τα λοιπά και αυτή η κυβέρνηση έχει κάνει κάποια σημαντικά βήματα με τα δίκτυα 5G. Αλλά αυτό που μένει να γίνει ακόμα. Το δεύτερο, ίσως πιο μεγάλο πρόβλημα, είναι η φορολογία. Όλο το ελληνικό φορολογικό σύστημα, δυστυχώ, για πολλά χρόνια τώρα, ε, βάζει πάρα πολύ υπερβολικό βάρος στη δηλωμένη μισθωτή εργασία, στην οργανωμένη επίσημη εργασία των έμπειρων ανθρώπων, δηλαδή από ένα επίπεδο μισθού και πάνω. Το tax wedge, το λεγόμενο, εκεί είναι πολύ σημαντικό. Η σημερινή κυβέρνηση κάνει κάποια βήματα, έχει κάνει βήματα για να το διορθώσει, αλλά δυστυχώ δομικά όλο μα το φορολογικό σύστημα είναι πολύ άδικο για αυτού του ανθρώπου. Αυτό πρέπει να αλλάξει. Και το τρίτο θέμα είναι η ποιότητα ζωή. Η ποιότητα ζωή στην Ελλάδα από πολλέ απόψει είναι εξαιρετική. Το κύριο έλλειμμα είναι για οικογένειε με παιδιά. Κάποιο ο οποίο έχει την επιλογή να μεγαλώσει τα παιδιά του στη Βρετανία ή στην Ολλανδία ή στη Γερμανία, θα σκεφτεί, θα βρω αρκετά καλό σχολείο στην Ελλάδα. Και ακόμα τα σχολεία μα, με εξαίρεση κάποια ακριβά ιδιωτικά σχολεία στην Αθήνα, δεν είναι ιδιαίτερα καλά με διεθνή στάνταρτ. Όλα αυτά όμω είναι πράγματα που δεν είναι πολύ δύσκολο να διορθωθούν. Και γι' αυτό εγώ είμαι πάρα πολύ αισιόδοξο για αυτό το τομέα. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much indeed. Really interesting uh, presentation there. Uh, so our final speaker uh, from the panel is Faye McIntazi. Welcome and over to you. Mrs. Hoy, thank you for that address and uh, congratulations to The Economist for this uh, very important thematic uh, virtual event. Uh, I hope next time we will have the opportunity to discuss in a more physical way. I switch to Greek and uh, we can have our discussion in English. Uh, οπότε, κυρίες και κύριοι, καλησπέρα σας. Εύχομαι να είστε όλες και όλοι καλά σε αυτούς τους δυστοπικούς καιρούς που ζούμε. Ως ε, η τελευταία αυτού του πάνελ με τόσο εξαιρετικούς ομιλητές θα προσπαθήσω να είμαι σύντομη και περιεκτική. Θα συνοψίσω και θα παρουσιάσω κάποια κύρια ευρήματα των μελετών της διανέωσης και κάποιες ρεαλιστικές προτάσεις που αξιοποιούν τα συγκριτικά πλεονεκτήματα της Ελλάδας και μπορούν να βάλουν τη χώρα μας σε μια αναπτυξιακή και ταυτόχρονα θα έλεγα βιώσιμη ε, τροχιά. Έχουν ακουστεί κατά τη διάρκεια του συνεδρίου διάφορα ε, μεγέθη και, και νούμερα. Ένα όμως είναι πολύ βασικό, απλό και κεντρικό για την κατανόηση του ζητήματος που μας απασχολεί σήμερα. Ε, αναφέρθηκε και από τον κύριο Παπακοσταντίνου και από τον κύριο Χουλιαράκη. Είναι ο λόγος ε, χρέους προς ΑΕΠ. Είναι ένα κλάσμα που μας πληροφορεί για τη βιωσιμότητα του χρέους, ε, το οποίο φυσικά αποτελεί μια εστία βεβαιότητας για την ελληνική οικονομία. Για τον αριθμητή ακούσαμε πολλά. Ε, συνοψίζω, σύμφωνα με εκτιμήσεις ε, της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής, το ονομαστικό ε, δημόσιο χρέος της χώρας θα είναι στα 341 δις για το 2020. Να πούμε εδώ μια σημείωση ότι σε αυτό δεν έχει προσμετρηθεί 
η επίδραση που μπορεί να έχουν οι πόροι από το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης. Το χρέος αυτό για το 2021 ε, εκτιμάται ότι θα είναι περίπου στα 349 δις. Ε, γενικά ε, μιλώντας, μιλάμε για ένα ε, χρέος, σε όρους, χρέος σε όρους ΑΕΠ άνω των 200% ε, ε, του ΑΕΠ. Κάτι το οποίο να σημειώσω ότι δεν είχαμε ούτε κατά τη διάρκεια των ε, μνημονίων. Επιπλέον, η ανεργία εκτιμάται στο 20%, η ύφεση για το 2020 στο 10%, ενώ αναμένεται και ένα rebound, μια ανάκαμψη για το 2021 και το 2022. Ε, ωστόσο, πρέπει να έχουμε κατά νου ότι αυτά μπορεί να μην συμβούν, ε, αφενός λόγω ανάγκης συνέχισης κάποιων πολιτικών αποζημίωσης από διάφορα επάλληλα κύματα πανδημίας. Μέχρι στιγμής, να πούμε ότι έχουν πάρθει μέτρα αξίας 24 ε, δις, για το 20 και ενώ για το 21 μέχρι, στιγμή, μέχρι αυτή τη στιγμή που μιλάμε τα μέτρα είναι αξίας 14 δις. Αθρηστικά είναι περισσότερα από αυτά που θα λάβουμε από το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης. Ε, και βέβαια όλα αυτά μπορεί να αυξηθούν εξαιτία και αύξηση των αμυντικών δαπανών. Μην ξεχνάμε ότι έχουμε και έναν θερμόαιμο γείτονά μας στην Ανατολή. Ευτυχώ, βέβαια, να πούμε και αυτό ότι οι αγορέ δεν φαίνεται να λαμβάνουν τη μετρητή αυτή τη στιγμή που μιλάμε αυτόν τον λόγο, γιατί ο παρανομαστή, το ΑΕΠ, βρίσκεται σε προσωρινή συστολή για όλε τι χώρε. Βέβαια, πρέπει να αποφύγουμε και τη λογική και την οτροπία του ότι ξοδεύουμε τώρα που και εγώμαστε και αύριο βλέπουμε. Αυτή η νοοτροπία είναι παραπλανητική. Πρέπει να κάνουμε φυσικά έξυπνα τι δαπάνε μα και να καταγράφουμε και την αποδοτικότητά τους ε, αναφορικά με την αντιμετώπιση της πανδημίας, αλλά και τον αντίκτυπο στην οικονομία. Οπότε, ε, επανέρχομαι στο βασικό ερώτημα, τι θα πρέπει λοιπόν να κάνουμε για να ενδυναμώσουμε το, την οικονομία μας, να ενδυναμώσουμε τον ε, παρανομαστή, το, το ΑΕ. Φυσικά, χρησιμοποιώντας και τα μαθήματα από την προηγούμενη ε, μεγάλη κρίση, από την κρίση χρέου στη χώρα. Ε, νομίζω ότι οι δραματικότερε συνέπειε τη τελευταία δεκαετία εστιάζονται κυρίω στην καθίδηση των ιδιωτικών και των δημοσίων επενδύσεων, ε, στην ανεργία ειδικά των γυναικών. Να πούμε βέβαια και ότι η Ελλάδα είναι προτελευταία χώρα ω προ τη συμμετοχή των γυναικών στην αγορά εργασία. Και επιπλέον είχαμε και την, το brain drain, που σύμφωνα με στοιχεία τη Τράπεζα τη Ελλάδο και είναι ένα ε, νούμερο που είναι ευραίως γνωστό στο δημόσιο διάλογο, το είναι 427.000. Βέβαια, αυτό που δεν, ε, δεν λέγεται είναι ότι ε, οι νέοι αυτοί, που, γιατί όσο επιτοπλίστο νέοι ήταν αυτοί που μετανάστευσαν, τα τρία τέταρτα εξ αυτών ήταν πτυχιούχοι πανεπιστημίων και προσέφεραν στην, ε, παρήγαγαν προϊόν αξίας 50 δις στις χώρες που μετανάστευσαν, Πλήρωσαν 13 δις εφόρους, ενώ το ελληνικό δημόσιο ξόδεψε για ε, τη μόρφωσή τους το ποσό των 8 δις. Βέβαια, ακούσαμε και από τον κύριο Δοξιάδη ότι κάποιοι επέστρεψαν κατά τη διάρκεια της πανδημίας, καθότι η τηλεεργασία βοήθησε, ε, η συνθήκη αυτή βοήθησε ε, σε αυτό. Άρα, νομίζω, χρειαζόμαστε...